Up next, we bring you coverage of a hearing held by the House Government Operations Subcommittee on Employment and Housing. The topic is the current contracts investigation at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Subcommittee Chairman is Democratic Congressman Tom Lantos of California. Subcommittee on Employment and Housing will please come to order. As we continue with our examination of flagrant abuses and mismanagement of HUD programs during the tenure of Secretary Pierce, <coughs> our witnesses today will be Senator William Proxmire, Mr. Maurice Barksdale, former HUD Assistant Secretary for Housing, and Mr. John Knapp, former General Counsel for HUD. Any list of the outstanding senators of the 20th century certainly must include William Proxmire. Bill Proxmire served the people of Wisconsin and this nation with honor and distinction in the United States Senate for over 30 years. Senator Proxmire is commonly associated with his monthly Golden Fleece Award for wasting federal money. In the case of HUD, where abuse and mismanagement <clears throat> have cost the taxpayers billions of dollars, a platinum rather than a golden fleece award would be in order. Senator Proxmire, who chaired the Senate Banking Committee and the Senate Housing Appropriations Subcommittee, will be sharing his thoughts with us on recent revelations at HUD and what we can do to assure that these things do not happen again. Although our topic is HUD, our topic is also ethics in government. And there is no more outstanding practitioner of the highest ethics in government than Senator Bill Proxmire of Wisconsin. Our second witness will be Mr. Maurice Barksdale. The testimony of Mr. Barksdale, former Assistant Secretary of Housing, will give us further insight into the durham hosiery Mill project and the financial disaster that resulted from HUD co-insuring loans issued by a company called DRG Funding. Our third witness is uh, former General Counsel John Knapp. This is former HUD General Counsel John Knapp's second appearance before the subcommittee. On May 25, Mr. Knapp testified about an oral opinion he rendered in 1984. The essence of Mr. Knapp's oral opinion was that when Congress made the allocation of scarce units on the basis of population and need known as fair share, no longer mandatory but optional, all objective criteria for evaluating mod rehab applications were eliminated. By letter to the subcommittee dated June 9, Mr. Knapp retracted his testimony, saying it was, quote, historically inaccurate, end quote, and admitted that he never rendered such an oral opinion. <coughs> we intend to probe Mr. Knapp about this and other questionable HUD legal opinions. This coming Wednesday morning, the subcommittee will hold a business meeting to vote on a subpoena for Lance Wilson, who failed to appear at last Friday's hearing, although he was requested to do so. Our next HUD hearing will take place on Friday, September 15, after Congress returns from its district work period, when we will hear the testimony of former HUD Secretary Sam Pierce. In September, we will also hear from Mr. Hunter Cushing and Mr. Lance Wilson. This Wednesday, the subcommittee will be holding a hearing to examine whether the Department of Labor, under the Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974, commonly known as ERISA, is adequately overseeing and protecting the more than $1.6 trillion that has been put in private pension plans 
to provide benefits for more than 76 million workers. Unlike the savings and loan and HUD fiascos, where the problem we face is one of cleaning up a horrendous situation, we have an opportunity in the pension program to prevent a similar disaster. One final comment. As we bring this phase of the hearings to a close, the chair would like to express his deepest appreciation to all members of the majority and minority staffs who have worked together with great cooperation and who have done the bulk of the work. I want to express our special appreciation <clears throat> and bid a fond farewell to one of our Republican staff colleagues, John Atwood, who is leaving the staff of Congressman Shays. John has made a tremendous contribution during the course of our 15 hearings on the scandals at HUD. The majority staff in particular and I had the pleasure of working closely with John. We all extend our best wishes to him for continued success. Congressman Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, let me say that I was particularly looking forward to the uh, hearing today, and I regret that I'm not going to be able to be here for all of it, but uh, I particularly wanted to be present for the testimony of Senator Proxmire. I would note, and I'm sure you would share this view, that if anything, you understated his contribution to good government, and I think we're all looking forward to uh, hearing his comments today. Thank you. I appreciate my friend's comments. Let me state for the record that there is no way to overstate Senator Proxmire's contributions to good government. He has been a hero to many of us for many years. Congressman Weiss. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just want to add my words of welcome and appreciation to Senator Proxmire. I look forward to his testimony. Congressman Shays. Likewise, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to welcome the Senator. He um, represents someone who in my childhood I looked up to and still do. Um, and also to uh, thank you for your kind words about the staff and uh, John Atwood in particular. I've been very fortunate to have his help. Um, we've worked long and hard and our staff has worked even longer and harder. Before long, uh, Congressman Shays, you will reach our age bracket and, uh, and look back on a distinguished career. Uh, I am honored and delighted to ask Senator Proxmire to be seated at the witness table. We are deeply grateful to you, um, Senator, for sharing with us uh, a lifetime of experience, not just in the field of housing, but in the field of making American government open, honest, clean, and responsive to the, to, to the American people. You have been an ornament to the Congress of the United States and the subcommittee is, is truly honored by your presence. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. I feel as if I've died and gone to heaven. First, I congratulate you, Mr. Chairman, and I congratulate this subcommittee. The subcommittee has done the kind of work I wish I had done in 1987 and 1988 when I was chairman of the Senate Banking Committee and had responsibility for authorizing the funds of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Also, our committee had the responsibility for passing on the President's nominations for top policy-making positions at HUD. You have done the kind of job I should have done in a second capacity. As Chairman of the Housing and Independent Offices Subcommittee of the Senate Appropriations Committee during 87 and 88. That subcommittee had a parallel jurisdiction with the Banking Committee over HUD. Appropriations had the responsibility for outlays for HUD during that period. So I'm chagrined that I had no idea about what was going on at HUD until this subcommittee on employment and housing of the House Government Operations uh, Committee held these hearings this summer. Obviously, the first question I should answer for is why didn't our committee and subcommittee find out about the waste and fraud so we could have stopped it years ago and prevented the loss of billions of dollars of the taxpayers' money? We have to answer that question first because the answer will indicate what we should do to succeed in preventing this from happening in HUD again. It can also prevent this from happening in other agencies. I was reassured to read a few days ago that Director Richard Darman of the Office of Management and Budget declared that the scandals at HUD may be systemic problems that extend beyond HUD. Director Darman is right. It is also true, of course, that OMB must share with those of us in the Congress who had HUD jurisdiction the responsibility for failing to fulfill their and our oversight responsibilities. Director Darman has made a beginning in putting OMB in a position to prevent future scandals that could occur elsewhere in this massive trillion-dollar-a-year government. On June 23rd, Director Darman was reported to have met with high-level officials of, of government departments. 
Following that June 23rd meeting, he instructed the officials on June 27th to make an assessment of vulnerability of each agency's weaknesses. Director Darman also indicated that he would convene a meeting of department inspector generals to supplement the OMB review. So OMB seems to have made a start for which this subcommittee should get credit. Your hearings have sparked this constructive action by the executive branch. Now to return to my question. Why didn't our Senate subcommittees with direct jurisdiction act to prevent this waste and fraud? The answer to that is simple. We had no idea it was going on. HUD Inspector General Paul Adams made reports that were ignored by the Secretary, the OMB, the press, and by various committees of Congress, including the committees that I chaired. For example, the biggest single dollar loser for HUD was the Federal Housing Authority's Disasters Co-Insurance Program. The General Accounting Office and Price Waterhouse now say that the failure of this program will cost the American taxpayer $1 billion in losses. You know the story, but let me quickly review it. At the ins insistence of the Reagan administration, HUD became involved in a giveaway that provides 80% coverage by the taxpayer, that is the federal government, of a $5 billion coinsurance program. The program has become a disaster because HUD has accepted without challenge the self-serving overestimates of the value of the property being mortgaged without making their own audits. Why does the private lender overvalue the property be insured? Simple. He does so because his fees depend on the size of the loan. The excessive value has been so great that even when the owner or developer defaults, the lender is able to pay his 20% share of the insurance cost and still come away with a profit. So the taxpayer is left with the lion's share of the loss. HUD's mistake has been that with, that with the government assuming 80% of the liability, HUD should have insisted on adequate auditing by its own auditors. It did not. This became a program run by private lenders who could make a killing from high fees with or without defaults. So who's the fall guy? The taxpayer. The department's own auditor said that inadequate oversight has led to unsound loans, inflated appraisals, and inflated mortgages. Result, fat fees for the lender and fatter losses for the taxpayer. Now to his credit, HUD inspector Paul Adams did know this was going on as long ago as 1985, four years ago, he reported that these projects were inflated or, as he put it, over-mortgaged. HUD management ignored this warning. HUD management was not just laid back, not just uh, disinterested, it was negligent. So was OMB. So were some of us in the Congress who had the direct responsibility for staying on top of these things, and so was the press. The IG report was a public document. It would have made a terrific billion-dollar golden fleece, but I missed the boat. So the first lesson for Congress from now on is read the IG reports of every IG who has responsibility within your committee's jurisdiction. If the report raises any serious question of fraud or waste, bring the IG in and ask him to testify. To be specific, the chairman of the congressional committees with jurisdiction over each department of the government that has an inspector general should assign some member of the committee staff to read every inspector general report for that particular department. The staffer should report to the staff director and the chairman any matter in the IG report that indicates a possible failure of the department to comply fully with the law. The staffer should also report any indications such as over-mortgaging in the Federal Housing Authority's co-insurance program that might result in fraud or an increase in federal government liability. The second lesson is to be very aggressive in securing information from departments on their accountability system. Now, your subcommittee hearings have disclosed that monies were paid to HUD for property foreclosed by HUD and sold by HUD. When the millions of dollars in proceeds were paid to HUD, those millions would sit in the HUD offices for months. Not surprisingly, some employees just picked the money up. They stole it. Certainly hands-on management would have prevented such thievery. Any 10-year-old running a lemonade stand would bring in the day's take, uh, take-home pay, I should say, late on a hot summer afternoon and put it in her or his piggy bank. Any genuine manager would ask how much money comes into this shop every day. Who gets it? How do we safeguard it? Where and how often do we bank it? Who is responsible? When do I get reports on it? Thirdly, a HUD secretary should make sure that every housing and urban program for which his agency has responsibility is managed with full accountability on regular daily or weekly reports to the secretary and his progress. These are enormous programs involving hundreds of millions of dollars. The law requires clear of sometimes general eligibility criteria with a desperate need for housing by millions of families living in deep poverty with the huge federal budget deficits and the pressure on Congress to hold down every penny of spending, here is a program that calls out for meticulous allocation of limited federal housing money strictly to those most urgently in need. Now, Mr. Chairman, I'm about to propose something you will find very controversial. 
If it were not for the revelations of, of the hearings of this subcommittee, no one would seriously consider what I'm about to propose. Under the circumstances, however, my proposal is not only justified, it's essential. Consider the circumstances you have revealed. A former Interior Secretary asked for allocation of millions of dollars to build units for a developer who was paying the former Secretary several hundred thousand dollars. The developer got the money. Did anyone with responsibility for HUD in Congress know this was going on? No. A former HUD Assistant Secretary for Housing and a former HUD Undersecretary used these connections to secure fat contracts from HUD under the Moderate Rehabilitation Program. Once again, the special connection paid off with a highly profitable advantage for the inside track. Again, who in Congress knew this was going on? No one. The Inspector General did not report this gross influence peddling. Can anyone be so naive as to believe this is the way to be sure the neediest American families get the housing they urgently require? So here's what I propose. Henceforth, the Secretary of HUD and all other decision makers in the department occupying the positions such as Deborah Gore Dean occupied should keep a concise log fully identifying every person, including members of the Congress who call, visit, or write them in connection with any HUD matter relating to funding. The log should specify the purpose of the visit or phone call and quote the relevant parts of written correspondence. The log or subsequent report should specify the decision made by the HUD official in connection with the call. The meeting, call, or correspondence and its content should be reported promptly to the Congress and the media. Mr. Chairman, those of us chairing committees of Congress with responsibility for overseeing HUD had no idea this decision by influence was going on. Apparently, OMB had no idea either. Certainly, the Congress, the media, and the general public were kept in the dark. We should have been fully informed. Can anyone believe that if the Congress and the press had been informed of this influence peddling, that the whistle wouldn't have been blown loud and long? Congress and the press may fall asleep over Inspector General reports, but high-level influence pe peddling will wake them up every time. Some will say that requiring such reports as a matter of law is too burdensome, an interference with privacy, or it's micromanaging. This is nonsense. Every competent manager keeps a record of important policy meetings and written correspondence. Certainly he or she does so when decisions involve millions of dollars. Should the record be made public? Why not? <laughs> Keep in mind, these are public officials. They are on the public payroll. They are dealing with hundreds of millions of dollars of the public's money. Members of the Congress have an obligation, a duty, to know this kind of critical information as soon as it occurs. Why shouldn't the Congress and the press demand a full accounting on the record of all the conferences and correspondence of cabinet officers and other officials who dispense public money when these contracts relate to spending public money? I'm not asking that these conferences be public or the congressional staffers or the press sit in when the department secretary or other decision makers meet to discuss how, where, and how much of the public money to spend. I am asking that the secretary and others automatically notify the responsible people in Congress and interested media people within 24 hours, the timeliness is critically important, of the time of any discussion or written correspondence relating to spending of public money. A typical report might read as follows. Well, not quite typical, but this is a possibility. Today, the Secretary of HUD met with former Interior Secretary Watt to discuss a moderate rehabilitation project in East Overshoe, New Jersey. Secretary Watt recommended to the Secretary that the project calling for $20 million proceed. The Secretary of HUD has agreed. The funds will be released on or about the 15th of next month. Now, the information would provide accountability by the Secretary of HUD to the Office of Management and Budget, to the appropriate committee of the Congress, and the media. Without this information, there is no way OMB the Congress and the press can be responsible for the oversight that is their responsibility. Now let me just interrupt at this point, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, to say that there's a special reason why this kind of procedure is necessary. I noticed that the Washington Post yesterday carried a story and comments by uh, uh, your, uh, your subcommittee colleague, uh, Congressman Frank. And Congressman Frank indicated that he felt that the, at least the influence peddling part of this scandal may not be prosecutable, may not be a violation of the law. It's wrong, but uh, there's not much we can do about it. And frankly, I've tried to think of how we could phrase it, frame a law that would, uh, would prevent it. And it's hard to do it. Maybe it can be done, but I think it's difficult. It seems to me the one way you can get at it, however, is to, cry, is to require full and immediate disclosure that this influence uh, activity was going on. I think once that's done, uh, you're going to, uh, you, it's, you're going to uh, have it uh, reduced or eliminated entirely. Now, sure, thanks to the fallout from the current scandal and the hearings of your subcommittee, 
HUD may operate efficiently, honestly, and without favoritism for several years. But then again, it may not. The Congress owes it to the country not to take any chances, so why not require accountability from now on and play it safe? Keep in mind that just last summer, almost precisely a year ago, the country was shocked by the worst Defense Department scandal in history. Tens of billions of dollars were involved. Some 50 defense contractors were implicated. One top corporation executive declared that henceforth defense procurement would be nationalized. There was widespread bribery, fraud, inclusive bidding. Business Week uh, predicted a dire shakeup of the defense industry. Now, one year later, what has happened? A handful of conspicuous bribers and defrauders went to jail. The Defense Department is back doing business as usual. The lesson? Unless Congress follows up promptly and, deliver and decisively in the HUD scandal, right uh, as quickly after your, your hearings as possible, if they don't, a year from now, we are very likely to be back in another government department with more of the same influence peddling, gross lack of accountability, fraud, and plain thievery that is shocking the country today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator Proxmire, for <clears throat> what I can only describe as, as uh, enormously valuable, <clears throat> insightful, and uh, constructive testimony. I fully agree with your suggestion and recommendation. Uh, and I very much hope that we will, in fact, move on those. Uh, let me first ask you, if I may, about IG reports in general. Uh, I don't want to characterize all IG reports as uh, putting us to sleep. But most IG reports are a combination of accountees and pablamies, and uh, in fact uh, give one the impression that instead of deliberately highlighting problems, many IG reports attempt to camouflage problems, uh, to play down problems. We have had examples in going over our IG reports where statements were made some steps by the secretary have helped to alleviate the problem, but still difficulties remain. Now, when you get sentences like this, it's very difficult to act. Uh, I'm wondering whether you feel that the IG report itself needs to be sharpened and focused, and whether the IG report may not uh, call for specific action recommendations or specific actions by the appropriate secretary with dates, which would then give the Oversight Committee of Congress a checklist against which to see whether the secretary has acted. You know, one of the problems I suspect congressional committees must have had in the case of Secretary Pierce and this predates my time because I've been with the subcommittee only a little over two years, that the assumption was made that when Paul Adams made a recommendation to Secretary Pierce, telling him that problem X is present in uh, office Y, the expectation is that Pierce would move. He would want to clean up his act. This is on his watch. And it is only a year or two or three years later that another IG report in between the lines hints that the problem hasn't been cleared up. Do you feel, Senator Proxmire, that the IG report itself needs to be sharpened? Well, I, I think the IG reports need to be sharpened, no question about it, that many of them are exactly as you described. Some are good. Some are good. A, a number of them are. And uh, <clears throat> I still think that the prime fault here lies with those of us who receive the report and, and uh, do not uh, give it the kind of attention we should. But I think you're, you're, you're completely correct, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, in uh, particularly in calling attention to the fact that uh, they make a recommendation to the Secretary, the assumption is the Secretary has carried out that recommendation, nothing more needs to be done. Exactly. There should be a follow-up uh, within, uh, say, 30 days or whatever, uh, as to what action, if any, the Secretary has taken. As he said, he's not going to do it. As he said, he's going to do it. He's going to do it in part. Uh, so that uh, the, 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 it would be very constructive and, if, and positive if we, could, uh, if we could have a response on every IG report 
from the secretary as to what action he intends to take or has taken and, and have, that, uh, have that kept up to date. <coughs> the, the IG, when he finds that the secretary takes no action or takes action which is inadequate, has a number of options in addition to writing a second report. One of his options is, if the matter is serious enough, to go to the president. He, the IG is appointed by the president. He is not appointed by the, by the secretary of HUD. Do you feel that the IG has an obligation, uh, Senator Proxmire, to go to the president, <clears throat> who alone can appoint him and who alone can discharge him, and say, Mr. President, I gave this recommendation to Secretary Pierce. Nothing seems to be happening. I can't order him to move. I want to bring this to your attention. Well, I think that would be uh, certainly if the, if the IG uh, is uh, rebuffed at any point, he should go to the president. But it would seem to me that before he goes to the president, the president has an official whose responsibility is, it seems to me, to act on these matters, and that's the uh, director of OMB. Today, Mr. Darman, Mr. Darman's only been in office a short time, so he's not certainly to blame for anything I've mentioned here, and I think he's doing a good job from everything I've seen. But I would think that the, the orderly procedure should be to go directly to Mr. Darman and OMB, and then, then I think that, uh, that there should be access to the president in the event that he can't get satisfaction from OMB. The president, of course, we all know is very busy, and uh, some presidents are more uh, hands-on than others, as yes. we know. Uh, so that uh, I think that if we had uh, some kind of... Uh, of orderly procedure, that kind would be very helpful. How about the responsibility of the IG to go to the appropriate committee of Congress when the secretary doesn't act? Of course, I would like that very much on the basis of my past experience. I think it would be very useful. But I just wonder if uh, that's uh, realistic in view of the fact that I think that most IGs consider themselves to be, I'm the IG for HUD. I'm the IG for Health and Human Services. I'm the IG appointed by the President, can be dismissed by the President. If I go to the, uh, to the Congress, there'll be a feeling that this is, uh, I'm going behind the back of the President. I'm, I'm uh, not uh, uh, a good soldier. I'm not uh, doing the job I should do. Uh, uh, for the administration, I'm disloyal. So that I think while, while in, a, in, a, in an extraordinary case, uh, a, a conscientious IG would do exactly that, I don't think we should expect that it's going to happen very often. But do you think it would be reasonable once he has exhausted the director of OMB route and still nothing happens? Well, I would, it certainly it, it would be, a, <clears throat> he should be decorated with valor and <laughs> as he departs from the administration yes. for having done it. <coughs> Give him a gold watch as he retires, but, uh, but I, I, I just don't think that uh, it's probably going to happen. But I, I, I would certainly reckon it would be a good thing. And if you had the right kind of president, I suppose sometimes you'd say, now that's the kind of guy I like. He stands up to me. Some people have that view, but unfortunately not many. Um, one of the many, many contributions you made to HUD, in retrospect, was to prevent the confirmation of uh, Deborah Gordine as Assistant Secretary. I read uh, very carefully the record of your confirmation hearing, Senator Proxmire, and I'd like to read a small portion of, of that record, beginning on page 52. Um, it's about two-thirds down the way on that page, and I'll begin with your statement, the chairman. <clears throat> I'm sorry, will you, you're speaking clearly, but I think a little too fast for my slow mind, so will you? And Ms. Dean responds, I've always thought you talk too fast for me. And then there is laughter, and then there is a pause. And Ms. Dean says, have you switched programs or are you still referring to the Secretary's discretionary fund? Because we don't put out notices to the field for funding applications in that program. The Chairman, Maud Rehab, Ms. Dean. Okay, would you repeat your question, please, Mr. Chairman? Well, all right, I'll go slower too. 
And now I'd like to read very slowly, because I think in the next few paragraphs, we may be dealing with perjury, and I would very much like to ask your judgment concerning this. You're speaking here, uh, Senator Proxmire. We received a number of complaints that in 1987, this year, there has been no notification of funds availability to regional offices. This is troublesome because this notification is important to promote applications so that all worthy candidates have a chance to apply and that HUD has the chance and the time to rank the applicants. Instead, it is suggested that informal solic solicitations and unawarded applications from the past are guarded by you and that you personally go through the selections excluding review by appropriate staff experts. Furthermore, it is suggested that developers have personally come to you asking for awards. Now, as you know, the proper procedure is for HUD Washington office to deal with housing authorities and for them to deal with developers. In some cases, the, house, the housing authorities have subsequently alerted HUD that these funds aren't even needed. How do you respond to that, Ms. Dean? Well, to my knowledge, we do not put out a notice of funding availability on the MUD Rehab program. I've never seen us do one since I've been at HUD. The program instead works that the field officers receive applications from public housing authorities. They are rated and ranked, sent to the regional administrator, who forward them to the Assistant Secretary for Housing, the Federal Housing Commissioner. The Assistant Secretary for Housing puts together the applications, and with the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Multifamily Housing, comes to some conclusion as to where they believe these funds could best be used. Once again, they bring it to a panel of people, which is the undersecretary, the executive assistant to the secretary, the Federal Housing Commissioner. That panel goes solely on information provided by the Assistant Secretary for Housing. He gives us the information, and the three of us make recommendations to the secretary, who is the person who approves those units. I have never given or approved or pushed or coerced anyone to help any developer. Those funds go directly to the Public Housing Authority. As a matter of fact, I have regular meetings with Public Housing Authorities where I tell them that they should be dealing directly with developers. A lot of times, Public Housing Authorities send developers to HUD, and they meet with people all over the building. It's a tremendous waste of time. I let them know that, because those funds go to the Public Housing Authorities. Well, uh, Senator Proxmire, this testimony that you took under oath is in direct contradiction with uh, an avalanche of testimony we took under oath, and I'd like to ask you to, to make a comment on it. Well, that's certainly my impression, uh, Mr. Chairman. I have no personal uh, knowledge. I didn't, uh, uh, as I say, I didn't follow it nearly as closely as I should, or as this, this subcommittee has. I think this subcommittee has developed uh, a, a, a clear record, however, that uh, Ms. Dean again and again and again intervened in the, the, this program, and again and again and again succeeded in, uh, in overruling others and in, uh, uh, and in uh, having the uh, uh, recommendation that she made adopted by the secretary and, and put into action and uh, the developers whom she favored uh, funded. Uh, that when, when she says, I've never given or approved or pushed or coerced anyone to help any developer, that does seem to contradict what you've developed. As I say, frankly, uh, you have uh, far more material that you've developed in this, uh, these hearings that I've watched on television uh, than uh, anything that we developed in the, uh, <coughs> either in the Appropriations Subcommittee or in the Banking Committee. Uh, if I may pursue this for just one more minute, Senator Proxmire, on page 53, <clears throat> the fifth paragraph, these are short paragraphs, this one begins saying the program instead. Um, that paragraph, which I shall read again, describes how the program should have worked, and clearly Miss Dean knew at a time she testified before you under oath that that's 
not the way it was working. She says the program instead works that the field officers receive applications from public housing authorities. They are rated and ranked, sent to the regional administrator, who forward them to the assistant secretary for housing, etc. She knew that the public housing authorities often had no notion that units were being allocated to them. That the public housing authorities often were the last entity to discover that any units were allocated. And the allocation took place in private conversation between a James Watt and Pierce or Deborah Gordine and somebody else. And in fact, her description of the proper procedure and her obvious knowledge that the exact opposite was unfolding at HUD with her <coughs> and others playing a central role in perverting the process raises in my mind some very serious questions. Well, I think your conclusion is, uh, uh, I don't see how, how you can, uh, anybody could, uh, could re re rebut that. Um, she, what she says is very clear, they are rated, ranked, and sent to the regional administrator who forward them to the Assistant Secretary for Housing, Federal Housing Commissioner. Uh, and, and as you point out, th this is uh, not what's been done. I have one final question, which is, uh, which is uh, perhaps somewhat ironic. ironic. Uh, in 1984, I don't know if you know this, Senator, or not, Secretary Pierce appointed Ms. Dean to serve as a member of his Committee on Waste, Fraud, and Mismanagement. Uh, Congressman Lukens. I can make a comment on that, but I won't. <laughs> Nor shall I, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for uh, turning the mic over to me. I, I am still trying to <coughs> chew on that last morsel of information you've passed on. Senator Proxmire, I think everyone this committee in the Congress is impressed with the job that you've done and the tremendous uh, mother load of knowledge you have in this area. So I'd like to milk that, if I might, while I'm during my questioning, uh, as to suggestions for improvement and tightening the program so that at least the program part will, will function. Carly Hill's made an observation I've been repeating time and time again, that it takes hands-on management, first of all. Secondly, a strong IG, an aggressive IG, and I think we've seen these two things not happen in some cases, but although the IG has been adequate in some areas, I think they could have been far more aggressive in pursuing their findings. And thirdly, then a follow through by either the Congress or the agency itself to tighten the rules so that this kind of corruption and this kind of influence peddling cannot ever happen again in this particular government agency. <clears throat> so let me ask you a couple of specific things. Given those items, hands on management, strong IG, and legislative or administrative follow-through. Talking about the panel to which these requests for grants, project monies, should have been sent, apparently from our testimony, the panel never actually met. I think at least two, perhaps three of the supposed members of the panels didn't know they were on it, so it never existed. In your opinion, would it assist if we by law mandated that no project could be approved except it went through an actual formal meeting, complete with meetings and uh, minutes and records, uh, with a supermajority vote, so that say three out of five, it'd have to be four out of five, would pass on for recommendation before the secretary even had a chance to cast his final decision. Would that kind of structure, in your opinion, uh, be beneficial? Or would it really uh, I think it's very, very impede uh, the progress? Good suggestion and well worth considering, but I, of course I couldn't I think we ought, to, we ought to have that discussed at some length and examined and considered and, and uh, the, um, certainly be interesting to get a reaction from the people in the, in the department who had to deal with this uh, as to uh, why they would object to that. That seems to me to be completely logical and, uh, and desirable. But I do think that before Congress should act on it, you, we ought to have a record. I'm sure you'd feel the same way. Absolutely. I'm fascinated by the lack of structure because of the dismantling, for example, of fair share. When the fair share program was in, when it was policy, they had to meet and had to exchange views. And um, I may share with you something you may not be aware of. I, I probably sound like a broken record, but uh, I chaired the, the banking committee in Ohio in our home state savings and loan crisis four years ago. And the thing that came out of that for both Republican and Democrat governors 
who both allowed 10 additional offices to be created at a time that the, the um, uh, errant SNL, namely Home State, was running wild under a Category 4, which was like a red alert tag. They should not have been allowed to operate, let alone expand. They're both allowed to expand under both administrations. So it's not political, not partisan, at least very political. What it came down to was this. We could not prove in any case that the superintendent of SNLs for the state of Ohio had actually sat down with the governor and told him what those tremendous auditors had found and what they predicted almost to the dollar in terms of loss to the taxpayers of Ohio, or at least to the state of Ohio. Now, judging from that experience, which was really an eye-opener for me, all that that would have required to solve that would have been a mandate by law, or statutory or at least a regulatory uh, requirement, that the superintendent actually signed off that he read the report. And then within 30 days, he had briefed the governor, and the governor signed off the report. So that the line of responsibility, the chain of command, was unbroken. You could prove they knew what the report said. Everybody got off Scott Free in Ohio because nobody could prove that anybody had read the thing, even though it had been there in the files, you know, in this case, for three and a half years. Now, with that, given that kind of experience, and I give my obvious penchant for some kind of simpler solution rather than a whole new bureaucracy of inspector generals or a whole new bureaucracy of uh, agencies to watch agencies, can we not require internally a much tighter accounting system in terms of personal accountability? The person signing off, he'd seen the report and his recommendation. And that the next paper person signs that he actually got the report. Would that kind of thing work in your opinion, that approach? Oh, absolutely. There's no question about the fact that the, uh, the, the fair share criteria are very good. We shouldn't forget the fact that we have nearly 10% of our people, 25 million people in this country, living more than 25% below the poverty line. Now, these people desperately need housing, desperately. And we have a very tight budget, and therefore we should allocate the, those funds uh, on the basis of the, of the most meticulous attention to, uh, uh, to a formula to make sure that the, that the poorest people get, uh, get, the, get the help. They need it. They should have it. And they won't get it if you have it... Uh, if you, if you ignore the kind of criteria that you're talking about. I do not mean, sir, to imply that, that my solution is the only solution. I'm really trying to trigger a response for you because I know that your vast uh, reservoir of knowledge could be of great assistance and suggestions for uh, tightening the system and correcting some of the flaws. Let me go a step further in another area. I am fascinated by the almost total exclusion of the public housing authorities in every instance of this corruption not to be even involved in the process, let alone to initiate the process. What in your mind would help, uh, would require the PHAs, the public housing authorities at the local level, to initiate a request for housing so that uh, highly motivated, uh, profit-oriented uh, developers could not go there and say, hey, I can get this for you if you'll sign off on it. Should it not actually come from the PHAs, and is there some way to ensure that the PHA must go a certain portion of the path uh, administratively toward opening up uh, the application before a consultant or uh, these other persons could even be in, involved or brought on board? Or should we exclude them totally? Is there No, no, no. I, I think we should rely far more than we do on the, on the regional uh, uh, people to uh, to make, make the decision. Of course, there's the same possibility for influence peddling and corruption, of course, in the regions as there is in Washington. On the other hand, I think that there's far closer scrutiny by the press because they have a much uh, smaller universe to work with and, uh, and uh, there, there's more knowledge of it. If the mayor steps in or county uh, uh, executive, somebody with real clout uh, and, uh, and steers uh, uh, housing in the direction of uh, people who uh, uh, contribute to his campaign. Uh, I think the local press is much more likely to be alert to that and able to follow up on it than the national press can follow if, if the decisions are made here. So I, I think you're absolutely right that it, that it is essential to have a, a far more local input and the decision made wherever possible uh, in the regions and uh, then only overruled in Washington if, if there, there is evidence of some kind that uh, this wasn't, uh, uh, wasn't done properly. I appreciate the gentleman's salient observations and I will wrap up with a two comments. One is it seems to me that the system really is very simple and would really function if the PHAs at the local level were allowed to initiate everything and nobody else. They know their need and the local officials seem to me would 
by law, basically, should be required to pass a unanimous resolution requesting such housing before anybody can act. That would certainly eliminate a lot of this self-serving and self-motivated uh, uh, developing search for projects. And the second thing would be that as you go up the line, you, you mandate at certain levels review boards that must meet and must keep minutes and everybody must sign off on so that there's no doubt about the system and it would function, it seems to me, in a, in a very, very effective way. My last comment, Mr. Chairman, uh, triggered by your line of, uh, of questioning on page 53 regarding Ms. Dean's involvement, I think one statement in the middle of 53 that, that just fascinates me I think is probably more damning to her than any of the others. And it states, quote, I have never given or proved or pushed or coerced anyone to help any developer, period. Those funds go directly to public housing authority, which is not uh, particularly salient to uh, this statement, but that's a very interesting statement in view of what we've seen. I thank the Senator for uh, taking his time. I know his busy life of retirement, quote, quote, uh, to prove before the committee. We're honored. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Congressman Martinez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, I was very interested in some of the statements in your written testimony, particularly the one dealing with uh, the suggestion you make as to try to avoid uh, this kind of situation occurring in the future. Uh, and I don't know how you really can put any, any fail-safe program in place uh, uh, where there are people involved and where there are people looking to uh, circumvent the law or where there are people looking to gain personal uh, wealth from or whatever uh, there's always going to be the that slight possibility that finding some loophole or finding some way to get around it they're going to do it <clears throat> i guess one of the things that we've depended on in the past is appointing people of high character and, and uh, integrity to these positions. And I know in, in many of these positions that are confirmed by the Senate, every effort is made to do background studies and investigations of these individuals to, to assure themselves before confirmation that they're the right individuals. But we've seen over and over again that something happens. Uh, and and uh, it seems like uh, and there's a, a perversion of attitude, I think. One of it is that, you know, people understand that in government where you have elected officials, there's going to be political influence. But there's two kinds of political influence, one that benefits a constituency and, the, and one that's exerted for no personal gain, and the other that is done for personal gain and not for anybody's benefit except the individual's. And that's what we ever have to guard against. In, in your suggestions, you talk about requiring uh, the secretary and all the other key p p people in those positions to log everything they say and everyone they meet with. And I would suggest... Relating to, uh, to uh, funding. Yes. To gr uh, granting awards, I imagine. Is That's right. And, uh, and I would suggest, and, and then maybe have a dialogue with you on this particular idea, I agree with that probably everything should be logged and keep, kept a record of. The only problem is that sometimes we find those records are destroyed and that that may not be in itself the only mechanism to put in place. If I could interrupt at that point, yes. my, my, my argument was that it should be reported that day, that within day. 24 hours. Yeah. So it's not something that, that you put away. This, this, is a, this information comes out, as this hearing so, uh, so well indicates, years later, after the money is stolen, after everything's gone. What we, the point is to get it out at once and to make sure that the uh, that the people who use their influence know that they're likely to, that they're going to turn up on the uh, on the six o'clock news on television, and they're going to be on the front page of the of the uh, uh, newspapers around the country in the morning if they uh, if they use that kind of influence. And know that it's going to happen at once. And when people feel that well, I can do this, and maybe it'll show up years from now, but so what? I'll be three hundred thousand dollars richer, and, uh, and miles and away, people forget it. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. The problem here again, though, is that if we can, if a person meets with someone knowing that there is something coming down the, the pike that they may benefit from and they want to, they may arrange some meeting in some secluded place and, and really do it in such a way that, uh, and, and actually then violate the requirement. Then they of violate the law. You see, under yeah. present circumstances, an influence peddler comes in, uses influence, 
people people may disapprove or not disapprove, but there's, there's no uh, no remedy for it. If 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 the the uh, the public official meets privately with somebody, it doesn't record it, doesn't reveal it, then he's violating the law. And there should be some some stiff penalties for that. And, right. and I agree, but I still believe that. People that are inclined uh, to use their positions to their own personal well, gain. Well, you're right about that. Yeah. We're, we're, we're going to get people who are going to find some way to cheat one way or another, but you can't cure it completely, but this will help. But I'm wondering if added to what you've suggested, that also you require, I mean, not require, but uh, not allow uh, people in those positions that are going to make the decision to have any contact with the, the person receiving the award. You know, there was a process in place, and that was that people would make applications through the regional offices and then those would be forwarded for rating to uh, the national HUD. And then after that rating by staff people who were, who were qualified to do it, then they would be reviewed. I don't see anything wrong with that except what happened is uh, the, uh, the perversion came where some developer then made personal contact with, and your suggestion would prevent that to a degree, but also to enhance that system that you're talking about, maybe you, do you, you think at all that it might be wise to, to also place into the law or regulation or whatever or however you would do it, uh, some requirement or some regulation that says those people making those decisions about those particular awards cannot meet with a developer or the individual to whom the award will eventually be granted that the process should be followed exactly as it was intended. That. I'll tell you why. I think that it may well be that the, that the administrator uh, uh, can elicit uh, useful and, and proper information by questioning uh, developers. You may call them all in. You may call, uh, call in uh, just uh, the one who's probably going to get it anyway, but he wonders about the program. I think that there, uh, or you may call in the, the, the consultant, may want to see him, and of course uh, uh, we all have the uh, freedom of speech and the uh, freedom to, uh, to petition, and. And uh, so I, I presume that, uh, uh, that it would be very hard to draft a law that says that uh, if, you're, if you're engaged in this kind of activity, you can't even talk to uh, people in, in authority. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's simply better to have disclosure. I think disclosure does it in all likelihood. And I think that there are occasions where uh, people who are interested and people who formerly worked in HUD or formerly were in the Congress or formerly were in uh, some position of authority uh, may have some useful uh, contribution to make. And, uh, and should be allowed to, to talk to the people who make the decision. But as I say, it should be done openly. And if it's done openly, then I think you're, you're protected. Yeah, I, I can see your point, and I would not want to uh, uh, take away a particular right of an individual. No, but I think that could be done through the process, too. If the developer would feel that he would not be getting a, a fair evaluation of his project, or there was additional information, or he believes that there should be a review, review of it, maybe a a process by which at that particular time, in the context of that review, which is completely recorded, and other people are present, that there would be that review. But I'm, I'm simply afraid, and it goes back to another uh, point you brought up about the appraisals. It's the same thing. It's, I don't understand how there was enough wisdom to say in the single family uh, home uh, uh, program, there were appraisals that were done by certified appraisers that were approved prior to their use on put on a list and then subsequently when those properties need to appraise people were selected from the list to appraise it. it, it what, caught, what happened there is that those appraisers were then independent of any anyone. In the, uh, in the idea that these um, people who were guaranteeing the loan and providing the loan had their own appraisers doing the loan resulted in over appraisals. It's the, uh, the idea that an appraiser working for the same entity that's going to be the uh, money guarantor or the loaner is going to be, have, be under the instruction of that entity. And that entity is then going to say, uh, I need this appraisal inflated so that we can come in with these figures so that we can guarantee that we don't suffer a loss, never mind whether HUD suffers a loss or the taxpayers suffer a loss, we don't suffer a loss, and that's exactly what happened. Why didn't we then in multifamily uh, home program decide that we would have the same kind of a list? Appraisers independent of those appraisers that worked for those entities do the appraisals. 
Well, I think you're right. I think what we need is information. And in, in the co-insurance program, we had a similar situation where the, the, uh, the, the Congress and the, the uh, department didn't have the information they should have. All the auditing was done by the people who had a, 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 an, an interest in inflating uh, the, uh, the mortgages, mortgage value. And in doing that, of course, they, uh, they were able to uh, enrich themselves and, uh, and then run a big risk for the federal government. Yeah. Well, I would uh, think simply uh, see that uh, the same as we had uh, with the uh, savings and loan industry, where the people in-house were doing the appraisals and over appraising properties is one of the factors that led to their downfall, inflated appraisals. And I think that any time that you have in-house appraisals being done, you're going to run into that problem. I think that the appraisals should be made by independent people responsible to maybe the government agency that requires the appraisal rather than to the entity that's going to actually be involved in the loan process. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Proxmire. Senator Proxmire. Thank you, Congressman Martinez. Congressman Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, let me uh, uh, note that the three uh, first recommendations that you made, I think, are all excellent ideas, and I think there are some uh, uh, the type of things that our committee can follow up on and, and uh, specifically follow up on with Secretary Kemp. Uh, secondly, I'd like to ask you a little bit about the Inspector General uh, issue and the questions that the Chairman put to you. Let me see if I can summarize your general view of this. Tell me if, if I've got it correctly. The Inspector General is a presidential appointee. He's supposed to be doing a job for the President. When he finds something that's wrong, he should start at the Secretary level, the Department level, and try to see uh, that uh, his ideas are conveyed and uh, hopefully that something is done about them. But if he sees that no action is being taken, should take it to the next level up, uh, whatever those levels may be. It may be... Uh, in my view, it's probably OMB. OMB in, in this particular case. And uh, theoretically, if he has the opportunity, even to the president himself, if he still sees no particular action. Uh, secondly, that his uh, reports should be uh, immediately available to the Congress, should be specifically written so they're easy to understand. Uh, we can separate the wheat from the For the Congress, he ought to be uh, always available to the Congress uh, upon our request that he testify on these kinds of matters. Is that a, a, a general summary of your view of That's what right. the IG That's right. It's my understanding that the uh, IG reports are public documents. They are available sure. to the Congress and the, and the press. Uh, and I think it's, it's our fault. Uh, it, particularly my fault in, in this particular case that I didn't follow up as I should have and read those, report, those reports carefully or at least seen as I recommend, uh, I, I saw, to, saw to the situations I recommend that a member of the staff, a competent member of the staff, conscientious member would thoroughly examine the report and then make recommendations as to uh, what the report recommends, what we should do about it, if anything. Let me uh, uh, ask you a, t a rather technical question regarding the co-insurance program. Uh, just the way you characterized it caught my eye. You said uh, that when this program was changed to an 80% uh, uh, government, government obligation. Percent. Yeah, actually, uh, the government's obligation was 100% prior to that time. Uh, so at least from a theoretical point of view, the government uh, had the entire responsibility before the co-insurance program was actually put into effect. My, my point here is... Maybe it would be better if we had 100%, because then you'd have 100% responsibility for it. And you'd, but what we did is we took 80% responsibility and felt that the uh, private sector could provide the auditors and, uh, and oversee the program. And uh, inflated appraisals, uh, high fees, and uh, ultimately some bankruptcies were the partial result of that. Correct. Uh, I, I guess the point is that, that we have to be very careful how these programs are structured in the very beginning where there are large federal dollars involved. It isn't always the fault of maladministration. Sometimes the program itself can create the opportunity for abuse and even fraud. And I'm, I'm sure with your experience you'd agree with that. I agree. Uh, let me now turn to the, the most interesting of your recommendations, which goes to the uh, uh, point that uh, Congressman Martinez was just talking about. Uh, first of all, there are other agencies besides HUD who grant awards, uh, make loans, provide subsidies, uh, grants, and other kinds of, of federal uh, remuneration. Do you think that this uh, kind of proposal should apply to other agencies that Absolutely. are Absolutely. I'd love to have it apply activity. everywhere, but I think you, you start with what you can get. And uh, uh, frankly, I think that the best way to do this would be for the, for the secretary to voluntarily say, I'm going to do this from mm -hmm. now on. 
and, uh, and, and demand you, of his people that they keep a law. Most of the people who are who are in this position, not only uh, Secretary Kemp but others, are honest and able and intelligent people who want very much succeed and want to avoid any any kind of uh, of scandal in, in their department. Uh, and I think it would serve their purpose if they did it. Uh, but uh, I would think it would apply right across the board. In fact, I think that maybe in the Defense Department, for example, uh, you'd, you'd have an even greater reason to, uh, to have this kind of uh, requirement. Do you think also that it would be a good idea for those entities which receive federal funds frequently as sub-grantees uh, uh, who have large discretion in dispersing that money, such as the CDBG grant program, that they should also keep such records and have those available, maybe not on a 24-hour basis, but once a month they should ship them back to Washington or provide them to somebody. Well, I can't understand why we can't have it uh, 24 hours everywhere. It's not that hard. Uh, the uh, the uh, regional people uh, right across the board. I want to, don't wait, you kill these things sometimes, you know, by trying to do too much. And it's important that we do what we can do. And I think we should start with HUD and start with Secretary Kemp and so forth and see if we can work something out. And maybe it can be an example. But, uh, but uh, it seems to me that uh, this is uh, something that, uh, an idea that could work very well. As I say, at the regional basis, you, have, you probably have more alert uh, coverage because it, it's, a, it's a smaller operation. People in Chicago, Wausau, Wisconsin, wherever it is, uh, my God, they're going to stay on top of that housing authority. They know the people who are involved. There aren't very many units to be concerned about. And uh, they're going to monitor it closely if they, if they can get this kind of information. Well, we have some uh, information uh, that's come to our attention and some that's in the, in the public media that suggests that the local media doesn't always catch the kind of shenanigans well, of that can not. occur here, no, too. No. And uh, right. particularly where there's large discretion involved and uh, not a lot of oversight, it seems to me that your idea well, is no, a good one. Well, I'm not saying that the local people are any better than the fine people who are sitting here in this room at the press table. But what, what I am saying is that the, the local people have a... Have a I have a more limited uh, operation, and, and it's, it's easier for them to, uh, <coughs> to survey what's going on. Theoretically, there's a, there's a, a more direct uh, interest and direct connection between the press and the decisions made, is what you're saying. And I, right. I concur with that, but I just point out that we have we've seen some egregious situations where uh, allegedly money was used to buy cocaine and contribute to local politicians and that sort of thing. And uh, when the HUD inspectors or auditors tried to come in, uh, they were given uh, faulty books, and uh, until the FBI really got into it, uh, the story didn't unfold. It's hard for the local media to find it out as well. So uh, we might consider that kind of thing for uh, particularly the very wide discretion kind of uh, situations at the local level. And I, I, I guess uh, I have to ask you the, the final question relating to Congress. Uh, it is true you can overdo these things, but we get blamed for imposing all kinds of requirements on the private sector on the executive branch, and we're very good at avoiding um, imposing similar conditions upon ourselves when we're actually engaged in very similar uh, activity. Uh, and so I would ask uh, whether you think that it might not also be a good idea to uh, uh, impose some kind of a similar requirement upon the members of Congress, particularly where we're dealing not in generic uh, concepts or rulemaking, that kind of thing, but very specific requests by a particular entity, a lobbyist, or well, firm. Well, we have quite a bit of disclosure now. If, 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 if uh, somehow a congressional committee actually dispenses the public money, I can't think of any just offhand where it's done, uh, then there ought to be accountability of the kind I've described. But uh, it, 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 it would well, seem let, that... For example, if I can just interrupt, uh, sure. one interesting suggestion, and I don't recall whether it's actually found its way into the law or not, but was that special provisions in appropriations bills uh, had to identify whether or not they benefited a particular company, firm, individual, whatever, uh, and if so, had, had to note that actually in the legislation. And I, that was either proposed or recently acted upon. Seems to me to be something that you would have probably uh, uh, sponsored had, had you been here at the time. Uh, and that, so, so there are times when there is You mean when a member of Congress has an, has an ownership position in a corporation, for example, and the corporation is receiving a, uh, public funding. See, uh, what I'm talking about here is the... No, no, Senator. What, what I was talking about is where a specific uh, project is benefited by a congressional action. Uh, you know there are all kinds of special benefits in the Internal Revenue Code. Sometimes there are special appropriations. Uh, there were some special treatments in the SNL bailout program, for example, that related to only one or two firms. Uh, and uh, there is a suggested requirement that may have already been put into the law. I'm just... Uh, I don't recall that those have to be identified. Not that 
we can't do them, but they have That's to be fine. made public. Yeah. Okay. And that seems to me the kind of thing that um, uh, perhaps could be uh, done here as well, where members of Congress are going to the agency, you say report that as well. And uh, uh, perhaps where... Yeah, you know, if a member of Congress goes and talks to the, uh, to the uh, secretary or to Ms. Dean or some equivalent uh, person uh, asking for uh, uh, funding, uh, there's no reason why that shouldn't be disclosed. And I think a member of the, of, of most members of Congress would be proud and happy to have it done. After all, you, I mean, all, the overwhelming majority of representations like that are to help your district and are perfectly honorable and above board. Uh, but, uh, but I think that where the abuse occurs is when influential people come in and talk to the secretary and two years later a hearing is held by an alert uh, subcommittee headed by uh, Mr. Lantos and this is revealed. Everybody's shocked and surprised. It, it shouldn't be because as I say it ought to, it ought to be revealed uh, immediately. 24 hours after the conversation occurs. If I can just summarize, I think the key here is not to uh, uh, try to set up uh, too many regulations that inhibit the decision-making process, but rather provide a very open uh, public kind of disclosure of how that process is working and who may or may not be actually influencing that process. Would that be a pretty good summary? Very good. Yes, it would. Thank you. Yeah, very good suggestion. We thank you for testifying. Thank you very much. Congressman Weiss. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Senator Proxmar, although I don't know the extent to which uh, various agencies of government may have uh, uh, rules or, or disclosure requirements such as the ones that you suggest, I'm familiar with at least one. Uh, I chair the uh, subcommittee that has jurisdiction over HHS on go government operations. And the FDA, for example, uh, in its regulatory work, is required to log and to disclose any and all outside contacts uh, so that at the very least we can have a paper trail and we can determine uh, who had a voice at least prior to a determination or subsequent to a determination uh, made by the FDA. Now it varies in, in some degrees, but it's the same general concept that you, you speak about. The interesting thing that's developed, though, is that the Office of Management and Budget, uh, under its prior head, not under Mr. Darman, undertook what is really a, in my judgment and the judgment of most people who've looked at it, an illegal process of regulatory review. They have insisted that, they, that any agency of government before it publishes regulations, submit those regulations to OMB. OMB then is not covered by the same requirements that the FDA is. And so we've had any number of instances where we can follow FDA, but once it goes over to OMB, it's like a bottomless pit. And currently, with the reauthorization of the uh, Paperwork Reduction Act that's pending, we are, in fact, trying to get, in fact, John Conyers, who chairs the Government Operations Committee, has held a couple of hearings on it. We're trying to get legislation which will expand the coverage so that OMB itself will be covered as far as regulatory process and review is concerned. So that, indeed, your idea makes a great deal of good sense, and it's simply an extension uh, of what FDA already is required to do, and hopefully OMB itself will be, will be required to do. This is very helpful, uh, uh, Mr. Weiss, and, and, and uh, I, I think that the, uh, uh, I'd be a little hesitant to uh, make this any and all contacts, because I think the problem is when money is involved. In well, other words, the, this, the, the any and all is fine, and, and I certainly wouldn't change it for, uh, uh, for HHS, but, but I think that, uh, that I'd, I'd prefer to go uh, uh, in right. a more limited way, and I think that, that's, uh, that would accomplish a, yeah. a great deal. FDA, of course, is in a special category. It passes judgment on, on approval of, of, of drugs and pharmaceuticals, and uh, there's lots of money of at stake in all of those, yeah. and so that, that's Sorry. the reason why contacts are required to be disclosed. So, again, I think that you're really on exactly the right track. Um, let me touch on another area with you. I don't know how closely you followed the attitude of the Justice Department regarding these hearings and the, and the results of them so far. Uh, sometime early in the course of the hearings, the Attorney General was quoted in the national press that he was going to undertake an investigation 
of every regional office of HUD uh, to see whether there were criminal violations. Uh, that goes back, I think, to sometime around April or May. And then last week, the Inspector General of HUD, Mr. Adams, sent to the chairman, Mr. Lantos, a letter indicating, a uh, letter from Gerald E. McDowell, a uh, copy of the letter, Chief of the Public Integrity Section of the Criminal Division of the Justice Department, with a covering letter. And Mr. Adams reminded the chairman that uh, he had testified that the matter was under uh, review by the Public Integrity Section Criminal Division Department of Justice uh, to see whether, in fact, there was any basis for criminal action. Then he sent along a letter dated July 19, 1989, from Mr. McDowell, in which he says that he is, that they're turning down, declined prosecution of Thomas Demery, who had been an assistant secretary, and then goes on to say, I'm quoting now, should you come to obtain information not contained in your report implicating Mr. Demery or other HUD officials in possible criminal violations, we would be happy to review that information. Now, that has raised a great deal of concern within this subcommittee because, in essence, what the Justice Department is telling the Inspector General is if you uncover any criminal violations by other HUD officials or possible criminal violations, we'll, we'll be happy to review it. We thought that, in fact, the Justice Department was itself undertaking uh, a review of the, of the situation, undertaking its own investigation, as a matter of fact. And what's your sense as to that kind of attitude by well, I was shocked when I, when I read about it, and I think uh, the, uh, uh, after all, the Justice Department has the investigative uh, capability. They've got the FBI, they have their own uh, uh, investigative uh, competence, and uh, I think rather than, uh, than uh, to say that if, if you can uh, present us with the evidence, uh, then we'll uh, will consider prosecution, it seems to me that uh, the initiative ought to be with them. That was my reaction. Right, and, and, and indeed that was ours too, and I, I thank you for, for your comment. And then finally, in an area of ethics. If my friend allows on this point, the Please. chair would like to place in the record without objection the lead editorial from the New York Times on this subject, which is a, yesterday's, which is a scathing editorial in terms of the performance of the Department of Justice. Indeed. Uh, I'd be pleased to you. Um, I, I'm getting a little concerned that we, we're reading a little more into this letter than, than, than we should. Uh, this letter merely says that they are not going to prosecute Mr. Demery. And we have the IG who said he found no regulations or laws that anyone in his report had broken. It says in no way that they're not investigating. They're investigating now. They're just saying, should we obtain any information in addition to what the report has, let them know. But there's nothing here that says they are not investigating. And I have a big problem with any inference that says that the, IG, the Attorney General is not investigating. Well, if, if I, I may reclaim my time, I, I appreciate the, the gentleman's interpretation, uh, which I think is a very generous one, of. Uh, Mr. McDowell's letter, and I fully appreciate the very assertive role that the gentleman from Connecticut has played in the course of these hearings uh, from beginning right on through today. Uh, <clears throat> my sense is that if, in fact, the interpretation which I read into it is not that which Mr. McDowell intended, he has the opportunity to correct that. Uh, there, has, there was a great deal of public to do about it over the course of this past week, I've seen not one word so far suggesting that the interpretation that Mr. Shays has is the one that he intended. Mr. Thornburg or Mr. McDowell or somebody at Justice has the capacity to correct our interpretation if, in fact, we're in error. Uh, let me, let me... If I could just interrupt you and suggest, Mr. Shays, why don't you uh, write Mr. McDowell and, uh, and ask him uh, uh, if, if your interpretation is the, is the correct one? In other words, if, and as I understand it, what you're saying is he's a, he may or may not be investigating now. Yeah. He doesn't say he isn't, and therefore you assume he is. Well, uh, that, what what it would seem to me the logical thing under those circumstances is to put it right to McDowell. Right. Are you investigating or aren't you? If you aren't, then, then I think that, that, uh, that Mr. Weiss is 100% correct. If, if, he, if he's not, then, then it's uh, something else. 
You know, I've only been here two years, and I'm very new at this, but, um, and I haven't contacted Ms. Mr. McDowell, but I have contacted the Attorney General's office, and I have uh, been assured that uh, numerous investigations are going on with individuals that we are presently calling before us and individuals we haven't even thought to call before. Are they investigating or not? Well, well, I will ask specifically on that issue. But I, there are clearly, from this letter, is no implication that they aren't investigating. It merely says they're not prosecuted. Okay, yeah, here's my time. Um, well, anyhow, I, I think that's an excellent suggestion. I would be pleased to, uh, to get the response, whatever the response is, so at least we know exactly where they are. And I have one final area, Senator, that I'd like to to ask you to touch on, and that, it's an area of ethics. Uh, area of what? Ethics. Ethics. Last week, we had a witness before us uh, who had been a former employee of HUD, then left uh, and went into the practice of law uh, with a firm, and then subsequently into her own practice, doing a great deal of work, legal work relating to, to HUD. Uh, uh, work. And in the context of, of the course of her testimony, she related a, a situation where she was given access at uh, the offices of the Secretary of HUD, uh, with the Secretary not being present, but with uh, Ms. Deborah Gordeen present, of a letter which was, had been cleared by everyone else up to the secretary. The secretary had not yet signed off on it, had not signed it, and which was going to be uh, released publicly within, she said, was just about out the door. She did not represent, you obviously HUD, she was not an employee of HUD. She did not represent the company to whom that letter was addressed, which happened to be DRG, but she had one of her associates at the firm that she was with at the time had as a client someone who was in the process of, of make, having a loan application pending with DRG. The information obviously was important to that client. The question that I put to her was whether she thought that it was ethical for her as a stranger in this instance, really, uh, not representing anybody in the, in the situation, to be given access to that letter. She saw no ethical problem with that at all. And so I ask you, am I being overly ethically sensitive in this situation? What are your thoughts on it? And you're talking about a situation where there's a former employee of HUD who's left HUD and given access to a letter not released publicly. Mm -hmm. That's it. Well, I suppose it depends on the content of the letter, and I, I haven't seen the letter, and uh, it's hard for me to make any any uh, any judgment. It uh, it could be either one. It could be yeah, a it, well, it's, or not. it happens to be a letter which uh, has been the subject of some discussion here. It's a nine-page letter, uh, which uh, in its final sentence, in essence, lifts uh, a restriction on DRG after having spent the first eight and a half pages detailing all the terrible wrongs that, that DRG had continued to, <clears throat> to perform. Anyhow, I will, I will I'd, 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 I'd prefer, before I make any, any judgment on that kind of thing, I'd want to read the letter you carefully bet. and consider more okay. of the information. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congressman Shays. Thank you, Mr. Proxmire. I, as always, find your comments refreshing. Uh, because, as you point out, there's blame to go around, and obviously it's to varying degrees. But uh, that's really the case in a lot of the problems that we end up with in Washington, that we all have shared responsibilities and, and we all have a role to play in their solutions. In thinking about the purpose of this hearing, I have to tell you, after the, the hearing we had on Friday, I, I went home depressed. I, I feel like we're just, the story is getting worse and worse, and I, I almost feel like we've become part of the Spanish Inquisition, in a sense, that we're just uncovering more. We have reluctant witnesses. We get them to admit their wrong deeds. Uh, they may, in fact, not have committed illegal acts, uh, but, uh, very, uh, but committed very slimy deeds. Um, we're looking to, as the Secretary has said, uh, He's identified HUD as a swamp. Uh, we're looking to help him drain this swamp. Uh, we're looking to help him cancel some programs, uh, modify others, uh, adopt some new ones, 
and in all instances tough in the regulation. And it just strikes me, though, we get in this, this situation where we have these trade-offs where we talk about we want to deregulate, and then we realize that the reason we had regulations to start with was to, in some cases, prevent abuses. So it's, um, I looked at your suggestion, and I like it. Uh, in terms of the recording and, and the dissemination of information. But I, I do realize that one of the problems that we've had at HUD is we have people who come and say, you know, these are my papers, these are my applications, this is what I had to do to get this measly grant. Now, and that's that exactly why I, I would confine this to uh, the, the money involved, the amount of money involved, identifying fully the person who made the representation. And the little report I, example I gave with respect to uh, a former Secretary Watt uh, is about what I have in mind. In other words, three or four lines. Simple. And the, the secretary, even if he's very active, would, uh, and, and other people in the department probably wouldn't have more than uh, several a week, two or three a week maybe. So it, w it would be, uh, uh, it would seem to me, uh, workable and simple. Uh, it seems to me it would be as well. I'm just making the point to you that some of this whole, you know, we have the two extremes. We have the Deborah Gordeen uh, type of uh, requirement. That's one letter saying, I want it. And then we have uh, a lot of the agency requirements, and, and the stack is pretty high, and there's probably got to be somewhere in between. Yeah. Um, when I, I think of, um, of the IG's report, I just want to say that, that the, the, the IG's do audits and they do investigations, and they're pretty thick documents. What we usually see as a committee is their six-month summary, which ends up being uh, pretty condensed. The, the meaty material is, is hard to find in there. And it's, uh, I just basically want to say, uh, in concurrence to my chairman, that, that quite often we do see, you know, there's a problem here, but they're making, uh, they're making efforts to change it. And then four months later, we find they haven't, in fact, changed it. So it is difficult from the reports that we get every six months, which makes me feel that we're really going to have to see the, the primary documents, the, 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 the hundreds of investigations that actually happen. And, and you're right, we probably should assign people to look at those reports. Yeah. Uh, I, I love your idea about uh, going directly to, uh, to the director of OMB. Um, I'm a little concerned, though, in one sense with the response that, you know, should they come here and, and you were very candid, you'd say, you know, they could get out their resume and look for another job. But in essence, they say, you know, they have this arm's length agreement from the department. And yet it's very clear to us that there really isn't. I mean, you're dealing with these people on a day-to-day -day basis and maybe you can't have an, an, an antagonist working in the department um, trying to get information. Maybe they have to work closely with the people. But the bottom line is, I don't, in theory, I don't see this arm's length relationship between an IG, and with not passing judgment on HUD, any IG, the arm's length agreement between an IG and the department that he actually has to work within. And I guess my, my question is, why couldn't an IG simply say, when he says to the <laughs> OMB, you've got a problem here, why couldn't he also be required by law to, to tell us the same thing as he's telling the director of OMB? Well, you could require him by law to do it. My point is that it's going to be uh, difficult for the IG who's going to consider himself, as I say, appointed by the president, can be discharged by the president at any time, working within the department, his responsibility to the department, to do much to make the department look bad, and uh, then to go to Congress to do it. It would, it would uh, seem to me that, uh, that, uh, uh, that it's very hard to work in this. We can find there are some IGs, like I think the HHS IG has done a superb job. Uh, the, they've had two or three in the Defense Department. Uh, the first one they had was, was good. I think that it hasn't been as, as vigorous since then. Uh, and, and I think it, it would be a, the IGs are so important mm -hmm. to get at the problems you have with a trillion dollar budget that I think it's, uh, it's very important that we concentrate a lot of energy and a lot of effort on, on improving IG performance. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hope that's Any way what, you can. I hope that's one of the results of this committee is that we will recommend maybe not major reforms to the IG process, but uh, clearly some modifications to the way they do business. The, um, one of the things that happened in the report of the IG is he constantly, re constantly, I'm getting carried away here, he made mention to the fact that some of these abuses took place because of the vacating regulations that were done uh, verbally. And I'm not even aware that you can vacate a regulation without following a process, but maybe you with 30 years experience could tell me, uh, isn't it, wouldn't it be highly uh, irregular for, for a, a, a council to just verbally vacate a regulation and say it doesn't apply? And, and if it can be done verbally, shouldn't we require 
that legally uh, it has to be done in writing? I'm certainly not at all expert on that. I couldn't give you even a view, a judgment. I imagine you have a, a committee counsel that can tell you. If it is, if it... I, don't, I just don't know. Let me ask you this, though. If it, Probably if it, Mr. Schumer, who's one of the brightest men in the Congress, could uh, give you an answer. The other members of the committee are equally intelligent. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not equally, perhaps. <laughs> no, but only, <laughs> <laughs> only one Schumer. <laughs> you, you're going to get... He's, a, he's the last one up here. He's got to be careful. About I've him. learned a lot of lessons uh, from Charlie. That's just uh, One is to be very careful of him. Um, the... Um, but it would be, seem logical to me, and would it seem logical to you that if, if, if they vacate a regulation, it should be done in writing and there should oh, be yes, some paper? Oh, yes, absolutely. Certainly. One of the um, things that, that's come up to me, that I found, uh, you, uh, we found two heroes since the beginning of our investigation. You're one of them because you stopped Deborah Gordine and you did it single-handedly when most of your colleagues thought she should be appointed. Uh, and Shirley Weissman is another who said no to the secretary and, and said no more than once. But we've only found two. One of the things that, that has struck me um, is that Deborah Gordine had tremendous authority and yet never had any review. And obviously, we don't want a close associate. You know, I think the secretary should be able to choose some close people to work with him or her and, and not have to have them go before review. But is there any way that we can, can clarify the positions of an executive assistant so they end up not having almost as much power, if not more, than the secretary? Uh, is that just an impossible? Am I well, going maybe down you a could wrong do that. I think, I, I think that, uh, that that should be a matter of uh, a very careful consideration by the, by the uh, subcommittee and by uh, witnesses who are competent to speak in the area. Again, I, I think you would want uh, uh, people to come in representing uh, uh, the executive branch uh, because uh, uh, if you, if you uh, uh, go too far in this direction, it is micromanaging, perhaps. Yeah. And, 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 and it just wouldn't work. Okay. Uh, I, I just haven't given it enough thought to I, give you I, a I use, think, useful answer. I think that probably there's no solution that I would gladly yield. Uh, doesn't uh, the secretary, after he's appointed, select certain positions over there in HUD who likewise are appointed, but he selects? No, I missed the first part of your question. In other words, uh, take an yeah. executive assistant. Uh, that well, let me yeah. go back to the point I'm trying to clarify. Uh, you said to Mr. Pro Senator Proxmire, uh, don't you think that the uh, secretary ought to be able to bring somebody in that he could work closely yes. with and feel comfortable I'm with? I'm talking to the close associates in close his office. Close associate in the office. But doesn't the secretary select certain individuals for certain positions that are subsequently appointed or uh, confirmed by the Senate too? Right, the d directors of the various well, uh, would units. Would he be selecting people that he could work closely with? And That's true. Um, but I'm thinking the person who is your executive assistant is really, a, a, it's a very personal relationship. And um, I'm not sure if, uh, whether Congress should interfere with that choice. But the bottom line yeah. to it all is that that individual, in the case of Deborah Gordine, had immense power. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, she, in response to your committee, pointed out that she was on three funding panels. Uh, and it, it raises the question, if someone's on a funding panel, if they shouldn't be approved by Congress. Well, th this position is likened to an executive secretary, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I would think that maybe there was something we could do to make sure that the only power she had is that that the secretary had, only with com confirmation of the secretary. Mm -hmm. Well, in this case, he delegated so much to her. That's the problem. <laughs> let, me, let me ask you uh, two other areas. The, um, uh, the whole issue of revolving door. I think of all the things I find most obscene, uh, it's the whole concern I have with revolving door. You take a Philip Wynn, who was FHA commissioner. He hires a Philip Abrams. And, and Philip Abrams then becomes the undersecretary. Lance Wilson was the executive assistant. J. Michael Queenan was, the, uh, was involved in the HUD in office in Denver. These four individuals were able to capture one-eighth of all mod rehab allocations during an 11-month period. They got $138 million worth of benefit. Then I take even John Knapp, who's going to speak with us now. He's doing work presently or ha for uh, the Wynn Group. Uh, Linda Murphy, who was uh, in HUD earlier, uh, out of HUD, uh, is able to walk into the secretary's office with her past relationships. We, we think that she could be involved in tens of projects. She didn't disclose any of them to us when we were here, and now we've had to write her to get that information. 
Joseph Monticello, uh, the regional director, making decisions that made people tens of millions of dollars of profit, vacating certain requirements, uh, ultimately now working for the various people he's benefited. Uh, Lance Wilson as well, having equity interest in, with people that he's benefited. Joseph Strauss, Sylvia de Bartolomez. It just goes on and on and on. And I, I'm beginning to think that a revolving door that just even says you, you should be and not have a relationship for one year is a joke. Because ultimately after one year they come right back in and, and they still know a lot of the players. It just seems to me that until we find a way to deal with the revolving door, all our efforts are going to be somewhat for naught. Well, not somewhat for naught. I think that the, what we've, uh, we've, we're considering today, the, the argument that the, the contact by the person who was a former official uh, has to be disclosed if it relates at all to funding. I think that would help to some extent. But you have a, it, it is a problem. On the other hand, you know, if somebody has served in Congress or has, or has worked in an agency and then he goes out, what does he do or she do? To make a living. It's the easiest way to make a living and make a good living and make a lot of money is to, uh, is to come back and, and work on your former agency. You have the contacts and so forth. Uh, so it, it may well be that we ought to uh, extend that uh, one year to five years or something of the kind. Uh, I, I, guess, uh, you know, I guess my, not feeling, my feeling on this, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. you I said. Yeah. My feeling is that there are millions of jobs out there. And so we're sure. saying you can't have one area. I mean, am I to say... Well, you're right, you're right. It would be all right with me if you, if you banned them for, for life, but I, I just uh, don't know how, how possible it is to get anything like that through Congress. The one thing that I find somewhat hypocritical of, of this whole discussion that we've had for the last uh, uh, two months is this whole th issue of influence peddling. You know, there's, there's been some witnesses who've come and they're shocked that influence peddling exists in the city. Well, as you know, influence peddling is alive and well in Washington, and in fact, the city thrives on it. Uh, you have your Republican and Democratic employee in the law firm or in the consulting firm or in the public relations firm, and the Republican goes to the executive branch and the Democrat in the firm goes to Congress. And uh, I'm just left with a feeling, and I'd love to have you comment in general about the whole issue of whether we should be shocked that there's influence peddling. It seems to me that's a way of life in this city. Well, it's a way of life, and all I'm suggesting is a, is a relatively minor suggestion, but I think an important suggestion, that you disclose it when it uh, relates to uh, funding, and you do it promptly. You do it within, uh, as I say, within 24 hours. Okay. That's it. Now, maybe you can do more. If you can, God bless you. Okay. Last question. Political action committees. Uh, one of the... the uh, we're seeing elected officials who in some instances have routine, routine, routinely um, advocated projects that aren't even in their own state. Republicans and Democrats, both sides. And when you, when you come right down to it, you find that they're advocating a project of an individual who's contributed to their campaigns. And um, it just seems to me that, um, uh, that somehow at the root of this is the whole need for congressmen and and senators to raise extraordinary sums to get, get elected. And I'm just interested to have your general comment about the influence of, of expensive campaigns and political action committees. Well, thank you for asking that question. That's the layup of my question. As you know, in the last, you may or may not know, in the last two elections, I didn't, uh, uh, didn't spend any money. I didn't accept any campaign contributions. My campaign in 1970, uh, uh, six cost $177, and my campaign in 1982 cost $145. Now, I think that two-thirds, at least, of the members... Most of that money was, was spent on returning... Campaign contributions. Campaign contributions. <laughs> the fact is that incumbents, all of us as incumbents, everybody on this committee, and, and I had the same advantage in the, in the Senate, has a terrific advantage to begin with. I think that two-thirds of the members of the House and probably 80 or 85 percent of the, I mean, two-thirds of the members of the Senate and 80 or 85 percent of the members of the House could be re-elected without, uh, without uh, spending a nickel in their campaign. You have the advantage of, uh, of name identification, you have the staff, you have, a, uh, you have a newsletter, you have all kinds of, uh, of advantages to begin with. And then on top of that, of course, in the last election, as you know, the incumbents got uh, eight out of every nine PAC dollars. But uh, I don't think that Congress, <laughs> realistically, is going to uh, do what I would like to do, which is to say, in the future, anybody running for re-election uh, uh, after six years in the House and, uh, 
And after uh, one term in the Senate, uh, can't spend any money. We have to pass a constitutional amendment to do that. And I don't think it's very realistic that in our lifetime it will pass. Maybe if you fellas started it, you get credit for starting it. You wouldn't have to worry about it because it wouldn't be the law until, <laughs> until after you were long gone. Congressman Schumer. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Once again, I'm grateful for the opportunity to sit in on these hearings. And Senator, uh, let me return the bouquet. I think that you are one of, have been throughout your career and throughout the history of the Senate and the Congress one of the most effective and one of the most uh, uh, honest and filled with integrity uh, members of that body, uh, equal only to all the others who had served there. Um, but no, I mean the comment very seriously. You've been a wonderful beacon to many of us who started our legislative career, who started reading about you when we leafed through the news magazines uh, when we were in college and before, and it's been a pleasure for me at least to work with you on so many different issues, and I'm glad you're back here. Uh, just one point following up on Mr. Weiss's comments about the Justice Department and uh, in terms of uh, what Mr. Shays had to say. It's not simply the letter that I think gives some of us a cause for concern about how eager the Justice Department has been to pursue these. One is, and I must admit this is hard to pin things down, is tonal. In so many other areas, you, I miss that. tonal, the tone. tone. In so many other areas, you hear the Justice Department saying, we're going to unturn, overturn, Underturn whatever they do, turn over every, turn over every rock. Uh, we're going to look everywhere. We're nothing, we shall not rest till we weed out everything that we can find here instead of the deafening silence that we have found in this area. Secondly, I find it very perturbing, and I was wondering what the, uh, uh, the senator's uh, view is, that they haven't requested the files of this subcommittee yet. Now, Many of these areas are not, you know, many of the areas we have explored are not a subject to uh, violations of Title 18 of the U.S. Code, the criminal area of the code. But certainly some of the things we hear at least raise some doubts about perjured testimony. And for the Justice Department to have not yet at this point requested the proceedings of these hearings, I find another example and a rather bothersome example of their seemingly uh, relaxed attitude towards everything here. So I, I don't think that uh, while the letter itself to me is hardly any evidence at all, I think what first Mr. Frank last week and Mr. Weiss today uh, are, are pointing to goes far beyond a failure to include some lines in a letter that we are investigating. Uh, no one wants to have um, specific names or specific types of investigations disclosed or compromised, but something that would indicate to us that uh, the central office at HUD is being examined, that they do care very much what goes on with these hearings and will look for any kinds of evidence of perjured or other kinds of testimony, I would find relieving at least to this member, and I chair a subcommittee that has jurisdiction over the criminal and fraud divisions of the Justice Department. Um, let me just at that point, ahead, let, let, me, let me say that after 31 years in the, in the Senate of the United States, this is the best investigation I've ever seen by any committee, Senate or House. Most thorough, most, uh, and, and it's uh, developed an enormous amount of material. It is shocking that the, that the uh, Justice Department has not uh, insisted on uh, access to your files. They've gone through your files carefully, begun it right now, not wait until they'll say, well, maybe it won't be through till Thanksgiving, then we'll go to work on it. Well, they ought to do it immediately. This is a very important uh, agency of Congress, it's billions and billions of dollars, and uh, this is the Justice Department's job. No, I thank you, Senator. I, I, I agree with those sentiments completely. Let me bring up one other thing, if uh, the committee could give you a copy of some testimony, again, relating to such stark contradictions to be nothing short of appalling. This is the confirmation testimony before, Deborah, uh, uh, before your committee of Deborah Gordine, and this is page 58, and uh, let me just read from it and then ask you a few questions. You, you, the chairman, Senator Proxmire, had asked, would you describe for, your, for the committee your duties as assistant to the secretary? What is your role in the process of awarding grants at HUD, number one? Ms. Dean states, 
Yes, sir. And I take it, by the way, Senator, are witnesses sworn in, uh, are potential nominees sworn in at these uh, hearings? I don't sometimes they are, sometimes they are not. I don't recall uh, uh, that she was sworn in. She she was sworn the chairman informs us she was sworn in. Okay. She goes, yes, sir. I sit on three panels that recommend to the secretary awards of funds. The secretary's discretionary fund, the moderate rehabilitation program, and the section 202 program. All three panels have the undersecretary and the executive assistant to the secretary as members and the appropriate assistant secretary of the program. Here's the part that I'd wish to underscore. This is quoting Ms. Dean. All funding decisions are made by the secretary. We do recommend to him areas of concern. Many times we are overruled. I sit on all three of those panels as his representative. Well, somebody's not telling the truth. Either Secretary Pierce had a role in this or Secretary Pierce didn't have a role in this. He said he never overruled once. So here, the testimony of the Secretary before us, sworn testimony, and the testimony of Ms. Dean, sworn testimony before your committee uh, a few years back, but all about the same relevant period of time, are in direct, I would say, immutable contradiction. Let me just continue a little bit and then ask for your comments. You asked the, que the chairman is speaking and saying, Senator Sasser, will you permit me to just ask two more questions in connection with the question I've asked before I yield to you? Senator Sasser, yes indeed, Mr. Chairman. The chairman, thank you. What authority has the secretary given to you in awarding grants? Miss Dean, none. The chairman, none. Have you ever approved a grant in the secretary's name using his auto pen or whatever without formally seeking his approval? Miss Dean, no, sir. I mean, there's nothing to say. It speaks for itself. And the next line was, I asked, has the secretary ever reversed a grant that was formally approved in his name? No, sir. No, sir. Uh, so if there's any doubt that someone is perjuring themselves or has perjured themselves before us, uh, I mean, again, I, I, I am not an expert on perjury, but it sure seems pretty, pretty black and white here to me. Senator? You that's about as, as obvious as, as, as it can be. I think you're 100% you're correct. Thank you. Uh, uh, nailed it to the cross. <laughs> that's not a very good analogy, is it? No. I won't even touch that one. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, but I think, I think that, that uh, there's no question uh, that uh, she did uh, she was not overruled in the words of the secretary. Either he, is, uh, he is, did not uh, state the facts or she did not. There's very little wiggle room in that, in, in that There's contradiction. There's none. That's right. And uh, as far as the auto pen is concerned, uh, once again, it was certainly uh, uh, our understanding, and I take it that you may have documented this here in committee, uh, but uh, it's our understanding that she, that was her job. She used the auto pen and used it often. Okay, I just have a few more questions, not on this area, but just in general. And again, I think... Your, your, uh, Let me just say one thing about, ahead, about uh, Ms. Dean that I didn't say. Uh, I think that uh, uh, I misjudged Ms. Dean at the time. I, I would, would have opposed her nomination even more strongly if I'd known. Uh, but I, I had assumed that she uh, simply wasn't up to it. She had a mediocre ed uh, education. She had no experience with housing, no experience with urban affairs. Uh, she'd been a bartender. She'd been a receptionist. But she'd had no, uh, no experience in the kind of business here. But I must say that what you brought out, and what I've read in the newspaper about it, she's a, she's a person who uh, has ingratiated herself very effectively. She represented the uh, Republican Party uh, and, and in the committee, the top people in the party, gotten uh, uh, appointments, uh, and I should say gotten funding for them, uh, enriched them in the process. And uh, to the extent that, that was her job, she's done it and done it very well. I think if she were doing this kind of thing in the private sector, in a real estate office or whatever, she'd probably uh, be right in there. But for the public service, it seems to me it's wrong. Senator, I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, uh, the more you sit here, just the more angry you become. I would guess, uh, since the chairman was gracious enough to invite me to sit in on these hearings, my blood pressure has probably risen uh, a whole bunch of points. It's just appalling, especially, as you know, when we fought and fought and fought 
for $10 million for this little program or $5 million here amidst all the cuts. And what was going on at HUD at that point in time was unknown to us, as you stated, but just, just mind-boggling, to use a phrase that the chairman uh, has inserted into my vocabulary. Um, it's, there's nothing one can say. You just feel a lump in your throat about it. I just have some substantive questions here on, the pro on programmatic things. Mr. Weiss brought up something that I didn't know and I thought was very interesting, and that FDA has this rule that you have suggested already, that all meetings be made public. And the only thing I would suggest there in general is that HUD is like FDA and the Defense Department, something you brought up in your testimony in this sense. First, there are vast amounts of money to be made based on single decisions. In FDA, because of the uh, uh, approval of a profit potentially profitable drug. In the Defense Department, because the contracts are so large. In the housing area, too, because you need, since someone might take a huge loss, you need some pretty significant gains to get a private developer to build this stuff. And I think what that means is, and you tell me what you think, Senator, Oh, the second factor, so there's a lot of money to be made, but there's also such huge discretion because there are so many people applying in HUD for the few projects that are available. In FDA, again, there's discretion. It's a scientific judgment uh, with scientists on both sides. And in defense, again, large numbers of people applying for uh, very lucrative grants. The combination of discretion and profitability is a, is a, is a very dangerous one. Uh, in government. And that leads me to feel that we need stronger rules for an agency like HUD than we would for a uh, normal agency in terms of oversight, in terms of audit, in terms of pres proscriptions, uh, prevention, preventing people both within HUD and those who deal with HUD from doing things that might be allowed in other agencies. What do you think of that uh, view? <clears throat> well, I, I certainly uh, feel that uh, I this isn't easy. It's not as if you can say it always ought to go to the low bidder. Right. Sometimes it shouldn't go to the low right. bidder. The low bidder isn't qualified, doesn't have the experience. Uh, on the other hand, when it does not, when these, uh, uh, these projects do not go to the low bidder, there ought to be a, a very meticulous uh, justification for it. It ought to be challenged and it ought to be challenged vigorously. Uh, but I, I think you just have to uh, get the criteria there, stick with the criteria, follow through on them. And uh, I don't think that challenge has been made either by the Congress, by OMB, or by uh, anyone else. Okay. My next question uh, is, again, uh, the chairman and the committee have brought out time and time again that instead of projects in mod rehab and in other areas bubbling up from the bottom, in other words, a locality has a need, they apply, HUD says, yes, your need is at the top of the list of needs throughout the country, and then they go out and get a developer, that the opposite happens. The developer goes and lobbies Washington HUD, and they say, yes, we'll do your project, and then they go down to the locality and say, hey, we can do it for you because we've gotten this money, and we've found several instances. The most glaring is the one in New Jersey where the locality didn't even want the project. But the wheels had already been greased, and, and what the Manafort uh, firm did was hire a different person, another person, or I, I don't know if, I, I can't recall, I think they may have used someone within their own firm who had good contacts with the New Jersey state government to go lobby them to s request the project. And it leads me to feel we ought to do something to strengthen the rules so that in, in, in these discretionary programs, the, the approval must come to the locality before a developer is chosen. Then let the locality uh, bid, with the develop, uh, bid for developers, let the program be changed or refined, but that the initial approval should come from the, to the locality before a developer enters into the uh, program. What do you think of that? Now, well, yes, and I think that what we have to keep in mind here is that we have, a, we have such a tremendous amount of need for improved housing. There's so many people living in, uh, very, very poor people who are living in housing that doesn't have adequate plumbing, doesn't have adequate electricity, uh, doesn't have adequate roofing. Uh, they, they desperately need, need assistance. And uh, it, it uh, certainly is, uh, is, uh, is virtually criminal to, to have a situation where the money goes on the basis of where a developer has the most influence 
and you don't, uh, we don't have a, a drive, a desire to provide uh, money for the, uh, for the millions of people who are living in, under pathetic housing conditions and, and need and deserve assistance. Thank you. I just had two more. Another idea I've been toying with is to somehow craft proposal that uses the idea of inside information, which has worked pretty well on Wall Street recently. And, and, it, and it's related to things the chairman have said and Congressman Weiss just mentioned before. And saying that if a public bureaucrat somehow discloses inside information, a very valuable commodity, as we've learned not only in this scandal, but in the Defense Department scandal, to one or a limited group of people so that others who wish to compete on the project don't have it, they are really, in a sense, um, committing an act of thievery against the government, taking a valuable asset and selling it in a certain sense, rather than, even if they don't get money in return for it, rather than letting the whole public know about it. Do you think that's a concept worth working with? I think it's a concept well worth working with, no question about it. And you're, I think your analogy with, uh, with what's happened on Wall Street is, uh, is a good analogy. Okay. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I only have one concluding question, Senator Proxmire, before I thank you. <clears throat> Last week's uh, Congressional Quarterly describes a very interesting interview with a person who I believe was one of your top aides, Mr. Thomas L. Vandervoort. Um, he describes uh, Deborah Dean's uh, visits uh, to him lobbying for additional mod rehab funding. And his comment is, I'm quoting, it's rather strange that an administration that consistently proposed eliminating the program uh, would have an official come in and plead for additional funding for this program. But the puzzle disappears when it becomes obvious that she used this program by her own admission in a political way. This was basically a slush fund that gave her and others political muscle, political influence, uh, by being able to grant it to favored individuals like James Watt and others. Would you have any comment on that, Senator? Well, it, it, as I've indicated, the MOD rehab program is an enormously important program. It's probably the most uh, logical and efficient way we can operate. We have something like 100 million uh, structures in this country where people live. And uh, so we can't simply, and, and it's very, very expensive to build new housing. That's right. To rehabilitate housing is the economical way to do it. Absolutely. And, uh, and this, uh, this notion that it should be uh, handled on the basis of influence, and there's no question that uh, that's the way it, it has been. You've documented that far better than anybody else has, but there's been other documentation too, uh, I think is a, is a terrible problem. In some ways, it's worse than, uh, uh, than enriching uh, former cabinet officers or whatever, because uh, this is a, a not only a waste of, uh, uh, of uh, the taxpayers' money, but it's a, it's a terrible uh, situation as far as the ill-housed people in this country are concerned. Senator Proxmire, you have been enormously generous with your time. We are deeply grateful for your insight and candor and, uh, and continuing public service on behalf of the subcommittee. I'm very grateful for your, for your excellent testimony. Could I just say one more thing before Please I do. leave? And, and that is, uh, uh, as I say, th this uh, subcommittee has done an outstanding job. Please don't let this uh, opportunity pass. It's, it's a rare opportunity people get to legislate in this area and to improve the situation. You have an opportunity to do it. I've made a few recommendations. I'm sure you'll get much better recommendations elsewhere. But uh, there's only a short opportunity to act. As I say, the Defense Department scandal that we had last year that's been forgotten with no effective action at all to correct the situation is an example of what can ha what's going to happen in 1990 if in 1989 you don't take, take the k kind of action. And you're the, you're the people who can push it because you've, uh, you've conducted these excellent hearings. Well, we you. are most grateful to you, Congressman Shays. I just want to say, Mr. Proxmire, Senator Proxmire, that I think one of the reasons we have uh, such an excellent opportunity is, is clearly the, the good work of our chairman uh, and, and, and the work of the staff, but also 
I think it's, it has to be somewhat unique that we have a Secretary of Housing who has, is, is, is totally supportive of the effort of this committee and has worked very closely with this committee. Um, and the relationship that exists, I think, between this committee, which is getting into areas that are very embarrassing, clearly, to, to the administration, the past administration. Uh, but I think we're, we're working well with each other. And, and I don't, and as a Republican, I have to tell you, I don't see any damage control going on. I see only a supportive effort to, to clean up this mess. And I think that's one reason why we have the greatest opportunity that you've described. Well, let me tell you that I do think that Secretary Kemp has one of the best opportunities that any cabinet secretary has, and he has it because of the work of this subcommittee. Thank you very much, Senator Proxmire. <clears throat> Our next witness is Mr. Maurice Barksdale. Barksdale, you please stand, raise your right hand. You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Please be seated. <laughs> I favor it. Mr. Barksdale, um, for the record, uh, we appreciate your cooperation. You are appearing on a voluntary basis. We would like to begin by asking you to tell us uh, your employment history at HUD. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I reported on board at HUD on, in October of 1982 as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Multifamily Housing Programs. I served in that capacity until November of 1983 when I was nominated by the President to be the Assistant Secretary for Housing, Federal Housing Commissioner. I served in that capacity until January 25, 1985. What uh, housing-related experience did you have prior to coming to HUD? Mr. Chairman, I've been in the housing business most of my adult life. My family owned property in Fort Worth, Texas, and I kind of grew up in the business. I spent five years in the Navy, and subsequent to my service in the Navy, I attended college at the University of Texas at Arlington. While, working in, uh, while uh, attending school, I started to work at a mortgage company in 1968. From 1968 to 1974, I worked for a mortgage company in Texas and in New York. In 1975, I became the vice president for real estate at Citizens Trust Bank in Atlanta, Georgia. Upon the death of my grandfather, I moved back to Fort Worth, Texas in 1975 and started my own little mortgage banking operation as well as doing real estate management and development. I have uh, managed and uh, developed and owned low to moderate income housing. <clears throat> in 1979-80, I was very active in, uh, in the Republican Party as far as uh, campaigning and uh, uh, in 1982 is when I was asked to report on, bo on board at HUD as uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary. So my, I've been in the housing business for 21 years, actively. Uh, Mr. Barksdale, there are several projects I'd like to explore with you. I'd like to begin with uh, DRG and the Colonial House operation. When did this uh, $47 million project first come to your attention? Mr. Chairman, I'm going to have to go and recall because I have not seen that's, the documents since I've left the department. But to the best of my recollection, in either uh, August or September, I think September of 1984, I received a call from the Fort Worth Regional Office indicating 
that DRG was in the process of uh, getting ready to fund a unit called Colonial House in Houston, Texas. Do you recall who called you? I think it was Mr. Walt Severe, who was the deputy regional administrator, if That's my recollection -E is correct. That's S-E-V-I-E-R, Mr. That is, Walt that Severe. That is correct. And at that time, I uh, asked him how many units were involved, and I think he told me 1,818, mm -hmm. which concerned me. Uh, being from Texas, I knew that the Texas housing market was relatively soft at that time, and more specifically, Houston, Texas was extremely soft. So I was very concerned about uh, the possibility of that size project being closed. I think my concern would have been the same if it had been any of the other uh, co-insurance participants at the time. My concern was about the amount of units. I immediately uh, confirmed with my staff that this closing was going to occur. I think this was a couple of days before the scheduled closing. I asked my staff to give me uh, a complete immediate review of uh, what was going on, and I asked one of my staff persons to uh, actually go down to Texas, to Region 6, to Houston and Fort Worth, to find all the details uh, about the closing, because uh, my gut feeling, based on my expertise and, uh, and, and my feeling about the Houston market, was that I was not uh, very happy about that size unit closing. After uh, the first day, and I stopped what I was doing. I mean, I literally stopped everything to see what was going on with respect to this Colonial House closing. After the first day, my staff reported back to me that they had visited the field and that DRG uh, had at that time completed their three test case review. Under the, under the, under the uh, regulations of the program, you submit three test cases. They had submitted their three test cases, and now they were independently uh, authorized to close loans. I said, find me a way to keep this loan from closing. I, I didn't want it to close because I just was apprehensive about the market. It was reported to me that technically uh, uh, there were no reasons to preclude the loan from closing, and uh, legally we didn't have any means to stop the loan from closing. So, Who, who told you that, Mr. Barksdale? Uh, members of my staff. Specifically, Mr. Chairman, I, I really can't say at this point, but it was a person on my staff. Suffice it to say that uh, I was told that we could not preclude this loan from closing, and it closed. Did you, clo did you talk to the Office of the General Counsel in connection with this matter? I talked to uh, representatives of the Office of General Counsel. Specifically, I cannot remember. I've tried to remember since uh, I did receive the letter from this committee indicating that this was one of the matters that would be discussed. I. Uh, I can't remember who I spoke with. But it is your recollection that you did talk to someone in the office of the general counsel. Yes. And at that time, I was informed that DRG had complied with all the requirements of the program, uh, and they uh, did have the authorization and the authority to close. And they closed. Well, in retrospect, your uh, sense of impending doom seems fully justified because your knowledge of the market certainly gave you warning that this will prove to be a disaster, and in fact it has proven to be a disaster. Um, subsequently, you placed DRG on probation? Yes, I did. Can you tell us why you did that? As a result of the uh, Colonial House closing, uh, which I was very concerned about, I asked my staff to monitor the activities of DRG and from time to time let me know how they were coming along as far as program requirements were concerned. And I was informed that uh, the development staff was very concerned about their technical underwriting of properties, a uh, review of the appraisers, and uh, the basic underwriting that goes into approving uh, a, 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 a commitment. Could you pull the mic a little Certainly closer. I can. Is this better? All right. Uh, I think around the 1st of uh, November of 1984, a couple of months after the Colonial House closing, I was informed by my staff that they had several concerns about DRG's processing. I met with my staff. They expressed those concerns to me, and uh, I felt that the concerns were justified. At that time, I made a decision to write, to have my staff write DRG a letter indicating to them that I felt that they should go back on pre-commitment review which meant that they did not at that point after receipt of the letter have the opportunity and the privilege to continue to close deals without us monitoring the deals before the closing. 
and I did send that letter to DRG. What contacts, if any, did you have in this connection with Ms. Carla Hills? M Mrs. Hills called me after the letter had been received by DRG and asked me uh, the criteria for, for me making the decision as for sending the letter, and I told her. And that was the only contact that I had with her. And I would say this was maybe three or four days or maybe a week after the letter had been remitted. I, I can't really remember, but it was after the letter had been sent. Did Deborah Dean ever phone you to inform you that uh, Ms. Hills contacted Secretary Pierce about this matter? Yes, I think she did indicate to me before I left the department that Mrs. Hills had contacted the Secretary. What was your response to Deborah Dean when she told you this? Well, I can't remember my specific response, but I think it was something to the fact, well, I, I guess Mrs. Hills has contacted the Secretary. I, I can't remember exactly at this time what I said, but uh, I probably said that, well, I guess she's contacted Secretary Pierce about the DRG matter. What was your reaction when Secretary Pierce reversed your original decision and lifted the restriction on DRG? Well, Mr. Chairman, I had left the department in January of 1985, and I think this matter uh, occurred in the spring of 1985. I was uh, concerned. I, I was not privileged or privy to subsequent information that had been provided to the department since I had left, but knowing the history that my staff had uh, given me concerning DRG Financial and still being concerned about them closing the $47 million deal in Houston, I was, I was concerned. Did you feel that your original decision to put DRG back on pre-notification obligation was the right decision? Yes, sir. So you felt then that Secretary Pierce's overruling your decision had to be the wrong decision? Based on the information that I had available to me while I was at the department, I certainly felt it was the wrong decision. I, only, I can only assume that maybe subsequent information that I was not privileged to uh, made him change his mind later that spring. But based on the information that I had, I think that I made the right decision and I was surprised that, that he had overruled it. Did you subsequently read or have you read recently Secretary Pierce's nine-page letter in which he lifts the pre-notification obligation from the RG? No, sir, I have not seen that letter. We will supply you with a copy just for your information because yes, I think it will be of interest to you. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the Durham Hosiery Mill project, uh, Mr. Barksdale. When did that project come to your attention? To the best of my recollection, Mr. Chairman, it was probably around the, uh, the, the spring of 1983, or it could have been the fall of 82. I, I've been trying to remember, but I can't Late remember. 82 or Late 82 early 82 or, or, or early 83. What action did you take in connection with that project? I uh, reviewed, let me back up just a moment. Please. I had an open door policy when I reported on board. I'm kind of a hands-on manager and I like to be involved in the decision-making process. And I like to review matters submitted to me by my st staff. And uh, one of the uh, uh, matters that had apparently been in the department for a long time was the uh, uh, Durham ho hosiery mill. Consequently, uh, I was informed by my development people, I think that Mr. Allen was coming into the department to discuss the Durham Hosiery Mill with staff. I indicated that I, want to, I wanted to be in the meeting, and I was present in the meeting. I uh, did not know until this committee hearing started that the Durham Hosiery Mill had been in the department as, apparently as long as it, it had. It's my understanding now it had been there since the late 70s. That's uh, at the time, I must have missed that, or I certainly didn't realize it. We uh, met with Mr. Allen and I think an architect, I don't know his name, uh, during our first meeting. Uh, he, of course, uh, indicated to us the reasons why he felt the, uh, the uh, project should be approved. I listened. I indicated to him the problems my staff had with the submission and uh, told him that it could not be funded. In your opinion, why did Mr. Allen subsequently approach Deborah Dean? I really don't know that, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, what would be your guess? 
Well, I, I would assume that at that time I was a deputy assistant secretary the first time that I came in contact with this particular uh, uh, project. I do not know why he would unless he was going to try to, of course, talk to someone that would be in higher command than, than I would have been. But in 1983, I do not believe Mrs. Dean, uh, Ms. Dean was the executive uh, ass assistant to the secretary. So I do not feel that after our first meeting that he would have met with Ms. Dean. How many times did you turn down that project, I think Mr. Barksdale? I, I think I turned it down uh, two or three times because it came back in, again in 1983. I think modifications were made to the application in 1983. And uh, in, this, in the fall of, of 1983, I think it came up again. We had another meeting with Mr. Allen, and uh, I turned it down again. And I think once, uh, when I became assistant secretary in 1984, I turned it down. So you, your recollection is you turned down this project on three separate occasions? That is my best recollection. Over a period of maybe a couple of years? That is correct. Well, Mr. Allen went to see Ms. Dean, according to our records, the first time in 1985, right. by which time she was executive assistant. Well, as I was saying, I left in January that's of 85, right. so that's, that's right. why I thought that would have not been correct. Do you believe that the funding of the durham hosiery project was an appropriate use of taxpayers' money? I can only say that at the time I reviewed the file and the times that I turned it down, Mr. Chairman, that it would not have been based on my staff's recommendation and my review and analysis of the file. At that time, it would not have been. Let me ask a couple of questions concerning Mr. Lance Wilson, who will appear before this uh, subcommittee in September. Uh, how long were you at HUD while Mr. Wilson was at HUD also? When I reported on board in October of 1982, Mr. Wilson was the executive assistant to Secretary Pierce. And I think Mr. Wilson served in that capacity until 1984 the spring of 1984. So for that period of time, I was there and Mr. Wilson was serving in the department. What was his role in the allocation of mud rehab units, Mr. Barkston? I don't think Mr. Wilson had any role in the allocation of units at that time, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was deputy for most, I was deputy assistant secretary for most of that time, of course, just sending information upstairs. And when I became commissioner, other than uh, uh, maybe talking to me from time to time about, about uh, submissions that had been made, he had no active role that I know of or I can recall in the decision making process. You observed the, the relationship between Secretary Pierce and Mr. Wilson. Could you describe that relationship to us? Yes, they seem to have an excellent working relationship. The, uh, uh, the executive assistant under the secretary's management style carried a lot of authority uh, because he did, he was, Secretary Pierce was not necessarily a hands-on manager. Consequently, the executive assistant acted on behalf and for the secretary uh, quite often. So they seemed to enjoy an excellent working relationship. And most of the time when I uh, wanted to uh, talk to the secretary, I would speak with Mr. Pierce, I mean Mr. Wilson. The fair share system was used to uh, allocate mud rehab units up to a certain point. Is that correct? That is correct. Describe for us what your understanding of the fair share system was, Ms. Barkster. To the best of my recollection, there was a limited amount of mud rehab units available to the department. And I think uh, on a regional basis, there are 10 HUD regions during the fair share process, units were allocated based on need and uh, recommendations from field offices uh, and fair share it out to the regions uh, based on a formula that had been worked out. How did that system come to be ended? In, uh, I think, uh, the 1985 fiscal year, 
it was my understanding that a decision had been made by the Office of General Counsel that uh, the department could utilize discretionary authority in, uh, in uh, sending the units out, and that was in 1984. Was there a committee to decide which projects should be funded? At that time, I was the assistant secretary, and I set up an internal committee in my office of, of staff members, my executive assistant and a couple of other staff members, and we would review the submissions, and, and I would ultimately make the decision as to where the units were going to go. Did you direct that any specific projects be funded in this program? No, sir. Under the program at, the, at that time, projects uh, would come in uh, from, the submissions would come in from housing authorities, and of course, we would look at the need of that particular city, that particular PHA, and then uh, the units would be sent to the PHA. They were not project specific. Mr. Barksdale, can you recall any consultants who approached you during this period with respect to specific projects? I can recall uh, Jim Watt calling me on an occasion. Yeah. Jim Watt? Yes. Mm -hmm. what, what specific projects did he I, call you? I do not remember a specific project, but I do know that he called with respect to my rehab units. And I Had you known him before? No, sir. Uh, describe as best you can the telephone conversation you would have had with Mr. Watt. Well, I think it was basically a very short telephone conversation. I listened to uh, his request, and I suggested that, uh, that I think I suggested he speak with the secretary. Did you find it unusual that the uh, former secretary of the interior should call you pitching a specific project? Not necessarily, Mr. Chairman, because I will say that all, all kinds of individuals would call the department. I would have uh, Were there Congress other previous senators? cabinet secretaries who called you? No, I don't recall uh, a previous, a, another cabinet secretary calling. I do not. Did a Mr. Bill Taylor ever get in touch with you in connection with any project? When I received the letter from the committee, uh, I noticed that one of the things you wanted to talk to me about was my uh, contact with Mr. Taylor. I don't remember a specific contact with Mr. Taylor. I understand that he testified that uh, he did speak with me, but I do not remember what he spoke with me about. I'm not saying that he did not, but to the best of my recollection, I can't remember what he talked to me about. I had a, a basically an open door policy. I was willing to meet with people that would come into the department, and I spent an inordinate amount of my time meeting with people. As a matter of fact, I would come in early in the morning and uh, meet all day and then have to stay late at night doing some of the work probably that I should have been doing during the daytime but I do, I do not remember specifically what I might have spoken with him about. On April 18, 1984, Mr. Monticello wrote a memo to you, which we are sending down to you, regarding the prepayment of certain HUD-held mortgages. I'll let you glance at it for a minute. What was your response to this memo, Mr. Mark Barkster? Mr. Chairman, quite frankly, I do not remember this memo, and I, can't, I cannot say without having any kind of subsequent information in front of me what, how I responded. In a typical situation, although all the uh, memos would be addressed to me as the Assistant Secretary for Housing, I wouldn't necessarily receive these, these memos. In other words, it was not like a letter that would be addressed to me that would come to my office for immediate inspection or, or approval or rejection. This type of letter would generally go to staff persons, and after they had reviewed the request, would work it their way up to my desk. Now, I, I don't specifically remember what I might have done or what could have happened on this particular letter. Do you recall whether at the time this memo deals with allowing a prepayment of a loan. Is that correct? That is correct, Mr. Chairman. Was it customary to allow prepayment of loans of this type? 
in certain situations, if the field office has recommended the prepayment, uh, yes. Uh, I wouldn't, when you say customer, certainly it happened, it occurred. I'm sorry. Yes. Do you recall routinely approving all such requests, or did you overrule any such requests for prepayment? I'm certain in some situations that I probably overruled the request for prepayment. Certainly in, in some instances I probably would have uh, agreed with the staff's uh, recommendations and approved them. I, I can't remember all of them. In this instance, reading, uh, reading uh, the memorandum now, uh, would you have had any reason to disapprove? Just looking at the names of the properties, Mr. Chairman, Evergreen Manor, Surrey Carlton, Sherwood Village, and Gregory Port, they do not spark any recollection in my mind, so I can't say that uh, I would not have approved them because I, I, I just can't remember. As, ma as a matter of fact, I don't know if I approved them or, or disapproved them. I understand. I understand. Uh, since leaving HUD, have you acted as a consultant on any HUD-related projects, Mr. Yeah. Barksdale? Yes, I have. Mr. Could you tell us what projects, what your role was, and what your compensation was? I can uh, tell you this, Mr. Chairman. I have acted as a consultant uh, when I was speaking, I think, with, with Mr. Weisberg uh, before coming up here. I uh, have started to put together a listing of those properties, and I plan to submit them to the, to the committee. Uh, I don't have a complete list at this time, but I will provide this committee with, with every project that I've been involved in. Approximately how long is that list? How I many projects are we talking about? I would say approximately uh, eight or nine projects. Eight or nine projects? Yes, sir. Over what period of time, sir? Well, I had the one-year restriction, and I would say since uh, 1986 to the present. And can you give us now a ballpark figure of your compensation as a HUD consultant? I think my ballpark figure, uh, Mr. Chairman, would be around uh, $300,000. Now, I'm sorry, Congressman Chase. Congressman Chase is asking whether that's the total amount for all of the projects. Well, that was a ballpark. Uh, the chairman yes. asked me for a ballpark amount, and for I'm in the process amount. now of getting the information together, and that was a ballpark uh, figure. For all of them over the three-year period? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you acted as a consultant for a project under, tit under Title 10 program called Autumn Meadows. Yes, sir. Can you describe this project and your involvement in it, Mr. Barkster? Yes, sir. That was a project located in Forest Hill, Texas, uh, the developers of the project had approached me as, as, as far as acting as their consultant. Uh, speak okay, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. is, is this better? All right. The developers of the, of the project had approached me as far as acting as a consultant to assist them in filing the paperwork and dealing with the local uh, HUD office and uh, securing a commitment. And I think uh, I worked on that particular project for about two years from the inception of the initial application until the time it closed, uh, which was the first part of this year, I think, to the best of my recollection. Congressman Lukens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The chairman, as usual, does a very thorough job of questioning. It doesn't leave a great deal of room. I'd like to go over a couple of uh, things if I might. I'm interested, from your standpoint, uh, in terms of the system, the standard operating procedure, SOP, as we in the military used to call it at least, for dealing with these things. I'd like to come to grips with this a, a little more cogently so I, I know that I understand all the factors and most of the factors you would feed into a decision. I'd first of all like to, re to cover the DRG letter, which you've not had the uh, opportunity to, to see, but to quickly go over some of the basic titles of some of the problems. Okay, pardon me, Mr. Lukens. When you say the DRG letter, do you mean my letter to DRG no, or, or the Secretary's sec letter of All approval, right. All right. in which he lists uh, some of the problems that have not yet that have been addressed but not solved? First was a non use of non HUD approved personnel. Second was financial analysis, where they simply submitted a narrative rather than a real analysis. Um, thirdly, rental analysis, when uh, they uh, uh, really didn't do an in-depth analysis of rent, but projected what, you know, a, kind of a dream world of, of rent uh, coming into the project. 
Uh, they would pass on to the tenants, for example, a total cost of proposed repairs, which uh, I understand is certainly not uh, SOP for developers or for these projects. And then expenses. They consistently underestimated expenses. And to give several examples, it's all DRG uh, co-insured. And capitalization rates. Uh, they simply did not go in. They based on assumptions rather than working models. Sustaining occupancy. They would overestimate occupancy. Same thing with uh, appraisal assignments. They overappraised property insurance requirements. They underestimated. Uh, As-built survey and legal description of properties were never complete. Uh, my point is, and my question would therefore be, if all of these problems occurred with, uh, consistently with a co-insurer, why would this have not, uh, why would this, first of all, have ever been approved at all? I mean, why, he, he ended up by saying uh, in the approval paragraph, however, until further notice, the HUD must be advised, I'm sorry, our review of the above discussion deficiency noted corrective action indicated should enable DRG to comply with HUD's co-insurance program requirements. My point is, my question is, they haven't done anything except make these terrible mistakes or these consistent errors. There's nothing in the record to, to imply that they would ever have, uh, that they were going to change, which they obviously didn't in time to save themselves. And yet the letter is a letter of approval. Can you explain that to me, the kind of thinking that goes into this kind of letter where you lay out all the problems they have and you say, well, it's by the problems we're going to let you operate? Mr. Lukens, I certainly cannot, uh, in good faith, indicate to you all the reasonings for why the uh, pre-commitment uh, review was lifted by the Secretary at that time. I can only say to you what I said to the Chairman earlier, that uh, based, I have not seen the letter at this point. I'm only going by what you, say, what you were saying is in the letter that I would have been very apprehensive at that time and with those, with, with those uh, charges still being placed against DRG Financial to, uh, to reinstate them. Based on my judgment, I don't think I would have reinstated them. Right. Now, now, as far as the reasoning why uh, there could have been some extenuating circumstances that I don't know about. Let me go to my favorite line of reasoning. What can we do to correct the problem in the future? The fair share uh, system was a good system, was it not? It worked. In my opinion, it was a good system, yes. And it could be strengthened. It could be even better. I think it could be. How sir. would you do that, sir? Well, I think at this time, uh, based on what I was listening to Senator Proxmire say, uh, I think I would, of course, try to come up with a system that would really be a, a fair share system, get a considerable amount of input both from the field and from the PHAs, and of course, uh, get the staff to come up with a system that would uh, would utilize all of the input from those different entities and uh, and really come up uh, with a system that would work. Uh, you mentioned a couple of projects that you had built into your office or created a kind of a <coughs> executive review committee that would allow you uh, to get the best advice possible before you made a final decision. That is correct, Mr. Lucas. That was not I required. That was not required. It was on your own initiative. Yes, sir. Don't you think that kind of requirement in all shops would be good, that would really serve to protect the incumbent assistant secretary in that particular area or any area, but also it would, it would really uh, serve, I think, to summarize and crystallize, crystallize the arguments pro and con? Don't you think? Is that the reason you did it? Yes, sir. Don't you think it's a good management tool for all assistant secretaries at all levels? Well, I think it would certainly be a, a, a good man management tool to utilize in the Office of Housing and I certainly feel it could, uh, it could work in other areas. Yes, sir. Good. Given our knowledge today and your, your experience to date, especially with this committee, uh, since you did not apparently keep minutes of those meetings, right. uh, don't you think it would be a good technique if minutes were kept at that kind of final write-off me uh, meeting for the future? Yes, I do think for the future that that would be a good uh, method to utilize. And that certainly would be a guarantee against excessive abuse uh, within the system for um, personal judgments. It would force a person to, to step out front and say why he or she is run, uh, making a final decision in opposition to the best judgment of his screening committee. Well, I do agree with that. And that would be an excellent technique as far as you're concerned. I agree. How far down the line would that kind of concept be functional and beneficial to HUD and to rapid consideration of uh, funding requests? Uh, be below the Office of Assistant Secretary, 
I think it could get to be a little bit unwieldy, unwieldy below that office, but certainly it probably should go down to, if, if you were going to utilize that concept, it would probably involve the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Multifamily Housing Programs, which is the next level down. I think after that it could uh, develop into an unwieldy process. But yes, I think the basic concept uh, is something that certainly should be considered. There's a lot of memoranda that apparently floats through all agencies, but particularly in housing. A lot of it's so technical, some of us don't understand it, don't understand what it really means. I mean, it looks like simple on the surface, but we have no idea, I think, of the follow-on implications in the field and the kind of dollar impact it has out, uh, out there where they're really building these things and where we're trying to get the housing to people. Would you recommend any kind of sign-off system on memos? For example, it comes, to, it reoccurs in my mind the April 1884 memorandum, which was just shown you to you as Assistant Secretary for Housing from uh, Mr. Monticciolo, the Regional Administrator. Obviously, you would not see immediately all of these, and you may never see them because they're really addressed to the Office of uh, Secretary for Housing rather than you personally. Is that correct? That is correct. That's what I was saying to the Chairman. I don't have the expertise or experience to determine which of these memos should be seen by you when they're apparently addressed from Monticello, who personally signed it, which to me means it's a little more important than just a memo floating out, you know, out in the world. Shouldn't there be some kind of a sign-off system so at least the initials show that, yes, indeed, this was seen and perused and noted by uh, the person or a person in the office to whom it's directed? Or would that be just another uh, unnecessary bureaucratic mandate? It could be somewhat unwieldy in this context, Mr. Lukens. We received on a daily basis many, many requests along the lines of this particular letter that's dated uh, April 18, 1984. In many instances, staff would find out that there would, re there would be reasons that this could not be approved long before that it would ever be brought to the attention of even the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Multifamily subsequent to be sent, sent upstairs for approval or disapproval by the Assistant Secretary. So I'm saying in, in the event that, a, that we had to uh, review each and every item, log it in, that could be unwieldy because of volume. Many, many, many letters would come into the department on a daily to basis paraphrase from the animal, regions. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. To paraphrase Animal Farm, some memos are more equal than other memos. Are there not some memoranda which really should receive, you know, um, uh, executive treatment that they really are more important than others. I just am not familiar with the flow of memoranda, with the flow of material. And I know it's voluminous, and I don't want to go overboard on a pet project, but it seems to me that some of them should be detailed. Uh, for example, some are more important than others, and therefore should be treated in a more urgent and uh, more, uh, a more important fashion. And if Mr. Monticciolo saw fit to sign this, which concerns me, and I'm sure he didn't sign every memo that came from him, originated from his office, it seems to me it should have been directed to some person for at least countersigning that that part of the process has been noted and recorded. If we didn't do this, I mean, Sister Mike, this at all, we could have a dozen memoranda in one day, which went from office to office, and we don't know who saw them. We don't know whether they ever ended up on the desk, the person who really could take action or should know about the contents of that memo. So I am at a loss as to how to judge and criticize or analyze the process. Well, Mr. Lukens, in a typical situation, this type of, of letter request from Mr. Monticello could possibly clear four or five different offices. It would probably have to go through the legal department, it would probably have to go through the housing management branch, the development branch. So there would be many arms uh, to the octopus as far as approving or disapproving. And that's what I was saying. Uh, it could be very unwieldy and if, if, if we had to log in each and every item that came into the department. Uh, it just takes time to get this kind of correspondence out. However, if it was dealing with major financing or approving a major uh, project as far as dollar amounts are concerned, uh, perhaps there could be a better system. I don't mean to belabor this, and I'll, I'll end on this point. I'm searching, Mr. Chairman, for suggestions that would prevent a repetition of this sad series of events. And before I do, I would certainly like to commend you, Mr. Barksdale, for, in my opinion,
you know, apparently being an outstanding employee and for the courage to stand on, uh, on principle and on your knowledge and experience against some of these projects, which I think history has uh, certainly proven you to be correct uh, on. My last comment and observation on this type of memo is simply this. Even in my office, when I want three people in three different key positions, say a chief of staff, legislative director, and a uh, press secretary, or uh, more likely uh, my district office chief of staff, to see something, I'll mark down at the bottom COS, uh, in abbreviation, in-house abbreviations for those three titles. Make three copies and then check off each one of the three copies so that it's indicated to which, uh, to whom it should go. What bothered me, and I will end on this, it still bothers me that we would have so many memos floating around that could be a major importance. Let me just make this point, and I may be totally wrong. If I am, please feel free to correct me. They're asking for a prepayment in whole or part prior to 15 years from the date of execution without the prior approval of the secretary. Now that seems to me to be a pretty awesome power. That's a, that's a pretty significant authorization. But they're asking for it only for mortgage A and not for mortgage B. And I don't see enough of a write-up or background in either one of mortgage A or mortgage B to, if I were in charge, to approve it or disapprove it. And so it seems to me that I'd like to know who got the memo and who would write off approval or disapproval and uh, you know just kind of what process it went through and the memo doesn't tell me that so i just kind of i guess shining a very small light in the big huge black hole but it seems to me like a more intelligent and more precise system of memo direction could be used within our agencies that would help us to determine who received what memo of, of what importance well, obviously a lot of them are just simply informational general informational but this could mean a great deal of difference in terms of money out on the front end. Well, I do agree. Is that correct? I do agree with you, Mr. Lukens. So I will say should... once again that I still, ha having just received a few moments ago a copy, of, I, I, I don't know what the ultimate decision was in this particular matter. I, I still don't know. Perhaps, perhaps this was turned down. I, d I don't know. It was approved. It was approved. Okay. I, I didn't know. Well, my point was I didn't know it was approved or disapproved either. And I'm simply um, kind of floundering here in terms of trying to identify various minor administrative changes and hopefully some major that would allow people to work more effectively and more selectively because, as you say, you have so many visitors, as we all do here, that your time is very, very crucial. And see me if you had 10 memos of which one was really important, that that one could be quickly identified and specifically directed so that it went more quickly through the system rather than just float in a morass of, uh, of memos that you, know, you could get flooded in an ocean of memos. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Barksdale, you've been a very cooperative and very uh, informative witness. I'm grateful that you came. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Lucas. Thank you very much, Congressman Wise. Hey, Mr. Chairman, I'm advised that Mr. Weiss needs to leave fairly soon, so I'd like to yield my time to him and then take his place in line. Please. Thank I very you. much appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Barksdale, I may have missed some of your testimony, and so if you'll forgive me, I'm going to go over some of it with you, even if it is duplicative. That's fine. I'm most interested in uh, the probation on which you placed uh, DRG and what happened immediately thereafter. Now, the chairman asked you about the, uh, your meeting with or speaking with Ms. Hills, Mrs. Hills, but I don't recall the response you gave. Would you tell me how, sh how soon after uh, you made the decision placing them on probation, that is, of uh, DRG, that you heard from Mrs. Hills? Okay, Mr. Weiss, to the best of my recollection, and I, and I uh, recall some of this from listening to the hearings, apparently the letter was, I, I remember a date from listening to this hearing of, of uh, November of 1984. Right, November 13 is when you placed 13, DRG 1984. on probation. Uh, what I was saying is I, I do not recall meeting with Mrs. Hills. Yes. I do recall Mrs. Hills calling me and asking me a, about the criteria that went into the letter, why the decision was made, and I think I related to her. I might have read the letter to her, or, or I might have discussed the issues that uh, were, uh, were in the letter. And uh, she thanked me for that, and that was the last time I spoke with Mrs. Hills that I can recall with respect to this matter. Now, 
You left the agency, I think, in what, February of 1985? No, sir, I left in January. January of 1985. January the 25th, 1985. Right, so that there was, in fact, uh, a little more than two months, about 10 weeks, uh, from the time that you placed DRG on probation to the time that you left the agency. That is correct, Mr. Weiss. Now, during that time frame, had you had any further communication or involvement relating to DRG? The only involvement that I had with DRG that I can recall after sending the letter was I did receive a, a call from uh, Mr. Don DeFranco, who at that time I think was president of DRG, who was very concerned about receiving the letter. And uh, he was very concerned. We had a very heated discussion. And he indicated to me that it would cause him, uh, his business, uh, great harm by being put on pre-commitment review. And I indicated to him that I felt that I made the best decision as far as the Federal Housing Administration was concerned based on their actions. And uh, other than the call from Mrs. Hills and the call with, the, uh, with Mr. DeFranco, I don't recall anything else. Now, did the call from Mrs. Hills come after the, the, the call from the uh, DRG person? I think it did because uh, I, I think Mr. DeFranco called me as soon as he received the letter. He was, of course, concerned when he received the letter. And okay. that would have been within well, how, however long it took for the letter to be received by Mr. DeFranco. I don't know how long it took. I would say within a couple of three days. Right. And then after the call from, from, uh, from Mrs. Hill, do you recall any further involvement or discussion or conversations within the agency or with, with, or with anybody outside of the agency in regard to DRG? I'm certain that, to the best of my recollection, I'm, I would feel certain that I, that I talked to some of my staff about DRG, how they were coming along, because one of the things I asked the regional office to do was to give me reports on the lease-up of the Colonial House property after it closed. And I think from time to time, they would call and tell me how the leasing was coming along, which wasn't that well. But I had no further contact that I can recollect with DRG other than the conversation with Mr. DeFranco and the call from Mrs. Hills. Do you have any recollection of any conversations with any of uh, anybody in the Secretary's office or the Secretary himself regarding DRG? When I sent the uh, letter to DRG, which was, uh, it's not something that would happen every day, suspending one of the major participants in a program uh, on a pre-commitment review basis. Uh, I feel, and I was trying to think about this when uh, I received the letter, I feel that I probably would have sent a copy of the memo to the Secretary's office, or quite possibly I could have called the Secretary's office to apprise his office of the fact that I had placed DRG on pre-commitment review, but I do not recall uh, hearing anything from uh, back. Did you, do you recall, and again, I, I understand that the chairman asked you this, but I missed the response. Do you, did you have any conversation with uh, Ms. Dean regarding DRG? I think I did have a conversation with uh, Ms. Dean with respect to Mrs. Hill's call to me. I can't remember or I can't recall if she called. I'm assuming that she might have called me and indicated that Mrs. Hills had called and wanted a kind of an update on what was happening. And uh, that would have been my contact. I can't recall any further contact with uh, Ms. Dean or the Secretary's office or with respect to that matter. Do you know Linda Murphy? Yes, I know Linda Murphy. Under what circumstances did you know her? When I reported on board in October of 1984, uh, Ms. Murphy worked for the department. I mean, 1982, I said 1984. 1982, I think Ms. Murphy was still an employee of the department, and I met her at that time. And did you subsequently know her uh, through her work with HUD after she left the agency? I would see uh, Mrs. Murphy in the building from time to time, but. Uh, as far as having contact with her, I can't recall that many occasions where she would have talked to me about matters, but I did see her from time to time. Do you recall having any conversation with her regarding DRG or any clients of DRG or prospective clients of DRG? 
to the best of my recollection, uh, I did not have any conversations with Mrs. Murphy about DRG. Okay. And finally, and this is totally removed uh, from these discussions, uh, do, were, there, were you aware of the so-called uh, going price on the street for uh, doing HUD consultancy work when you were with, uh, with HUD on moderate rehab units? From time to time, I, I have heard people indicate that uh, certain consultants uh, were uh, receiving certain amounts of monies for, for dealing with the department. I do not re recall specific dollar amounts. Uh, I, I, ca I can't remember that, but I do know that people were quoting figures. When did you first hear a quotation on the basis of unit price? Oh, I can't recall that, uh, Mr. Well, Wise. While you were still working? Yes, it was, it was right? while I was with the department. And do you recall any discussions within the agency while you were there as to the appropriateness of char have consultants charging fees based on a per unit price? I recall no such discussion while I was there with, with members of the department about it. I, I can't recall any discussions. Do you recall conversations with anyone regarding uh, per unit price for consultants on moderate rehab pro projects? On a per unit basis? Yes. I do not recall conversations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Congressman Shays. Thank you, Mr. Barksdale. It's um, fairly clear to me that, in, at least in some of the areas that we've looked at, that you have been um, someone who has said no to certain projects you didn't like, and, and I think that's really to your credit. Uh, I, I want to explore what you've done since you've left HUD and um, to ask you a few questions about that. I'm a little first perplexed that uh, you would have to give us a list of eight projects. If you said there were 50 projects, I could see a list. So I'd like to ask you um, what of the eight projects you can recall and, and, and what they were and where they were. The Title 10 that I discussed with the chairman, uh, which is located in Forest Hills, Texas, is and, one that I remember. And, and name the project again? Autumn Meadows. Pardon me? Autumn Meadows. Yeah, right. How many units? No, this was a Title 10. Oh. This was a, a land acquisition I'm sorry, okay. and development. Right. And there was a, uh, a project that I worked on in California where a developer was trying to secure. It wasn't units. It, Give me the names of the projects I first. can't remember okay. the name at this time, uh, Mr. Shays. I'll, I'll be happy to provide the name. Give me the town the name. name. Uh, this project was located in Ohio but it was a California management company that needed some assistance and uh, technical assistance in putting a proposal together to secure uh, some additional funding for operations of a property. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the name of the property. Okay. But it was not securing units. It was working out the technical processing. Okay. Okay. That's two. That's two. And that's, uh, right now that's, no, I, it, it is not believable for me well, to, no, it isn't, uh, for me to, to t have you tell me that there are eight projects and you made $300,000 and you can't remember any of the other names. And see, what I want to avoid is to have to, to request that you come back later. Uh, I, I was in real estate. I can tell you, uh, you know, I would be lucky to have made 60000 in a year in, in, in real estate, but I can tell you every unit that I was involved in. And I could go back and tell you six years ago. Uh, you don't forget things like that. You made $300,000, and you've only told me two units. If you had been able to tell me all the units, I wouldn't even think about it, but m something goes off in my mind that says there must be something he doesn't want to tell us. No, sir, that's okay. not correct. I will be happy to provide. Have committee. you been involved in any project recently with HUD that you can recall? Well, well Mr. Shays, I am in the uh, co-insurance business at this mm -hmm. time. I'm a part owner and executive vice president of Housing America Mortgage Company in okay. Dallas, Texas. That's and we have submitted one of our test cases to the department, which is a hypothetical case. Under the rules of the program, you can, su you can submit what's called a live case that you plan to close or a hypothetical oh, case. Okay. So what, is that, what is that case? Uh, I think that. it's called the Habitat Apartments. Okay. This is a case that's already closed in Dallas, Texas. 
and uh, it is a test that is a, a dummy case or a hypothetical case that the department is in the process of reviewing through the mortgage company. Do you have any uh, pro I'm sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, my apology. Please continue. Um, Do you have any projects in which you have ownership? HUD, HUD properties. Any projects that you're working with with HUD that you have equity? No, sir. Okay. Do you have any projects where you've been cons received a consultant's fee, uh, some financial remuneration equity uh, in any project, not HUD related, but is owned by individuals who you had dealings with while you were at HUD? To the best of my knowledge, no, Mr. Do you Chairman. understand what I'm saying, the question I'm asking? I, let would me you make ask sure. The question, would you ask the question again? Yeah. Um, I want to, I'm, I'm asking the question if while you were at HUD, did you make any favorable decisions or recommend any favorable decisions to individuals that you now have some or, or had after leaving HUD some business association with? To the best of my knowledge, no. What is the Drake Project? The Drake Project? Yes. The, the Drake Project is a, where is it located? St. Louis? Yes, the Drake pro Project is a project in St. Louis, uh, Missouri, that uh, I think was a, uh, a, pr a project that was developed by a St. Louis developer by the name of Bill Thomas. Yeah. I have no interest in that project. Um, or did you have any financial relationship in that project? I work for a company, I work, presently work for a company that uh, purchased the project from the developer uh, and it was a syndicator. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I did not have an equity position in the project. L let me just be clear on this because I, right. um, I, I want to make sure we're not playing a semantics game. Did, okay. you, did you ever work for uh, a business that dealt, I mean I'm getting a little, uh, uh, whether you were an independent consultant or or associated with a group of individuals who were helping someone on a project. Is that going to be part of your list that you're going to be submitting to us? I will be happy to, the list that I submit, I will be happy to, 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 to include all projects that I had any kind of uh, direct dealing with since I've left the department. Right. But the question, I think, was those properties that I acted as a consultant for, and I was saying I was going to provide yeah. that list. No, no, I, I think that the, the important thing would be any projects that you had involvement with. Well, certainly, I, I will have I, to go I, back. And how much, um, uh, the ones you were consulting, you're talking 300,000. How about the ones that you were, you, a ballpark figure that you made, how about the, the projects that you uh, worked on as an employee, I guess, of, of another firm? What, what was this other firm that you were involved in? Uh, this firm was called J&B Management Company. J&B Management Company. So you were hired as an employee there. Yes. Uh, did you yeah. ever represent this management uh, firm uh, in any dealings with HUD? Yes, I have. Okay. Uh, in what projects were those? Well, the Drake would have been one. Uh, uh, in, in the process of uh, closing the Drake, there were some technical questions that hit the table, I think, in 1986. And I do think that I visited with the St. Louis HUD office as far as getting those units closed. Who would have been your contacts uh, at HUD on that project? Who would you have spoken with? Well, in St. Louis, I think I spoke with the uh, area manager, Mr. Ken Lane. Mm -hmm. And uh, in HUD Central, I recall, I recall speaking with uh, Tom Demery, who at that time was the assistant secretary, mm -hmm. and uh, Hunter Cushing, and members of the uh, career staff. Did you ever have any dealings with Mr. Uh, or, or sign any letters or write any letters to, um, to uh, Mr. Pierce? Yes, I have signed one. I have sent one letter to Mr. Pierce on behalf of that company, which uh, was also involved in a St. Louis project. Isn't it true you also met with him too? No, I did not you, meet with, to the did. best of my recollection, I do not remember meeting with Mr. Pierce. I did talk to him on the telephone. Okay. What was the gist of your conversation with Mr. Pierce on the telephone? We, uh, we had been working uh, to secure additional working capital for this Laclede property for over a period of about two years. We had uh, kind of gotten a log jam in St. Louis, uh, and uh, I had spoken with uh, Mr. Demery, some of the staff people. I felt that we legitimately uh, uh, should be considered for the additional funding, and as uh, 
a last resort, I called the secretary to let him know that, uh, that I felt that this was a good property, that uh, I fully explained, and it was a rather lengthy letter that I sent to the secretary, the reasons why I felt the uh, housing was needed in St. Louis, why I felt the, uh, the additional repair work should have been completed, and I sent it to him. Now, nothing has happened on that property so far. That's been about, I can't remember when the letter was sent because I don't have it in front of me now, approximately uh, a year ago. And as of this uh, time, Mr. Shays, we're still meeting with the St. Louis HUD office and the central office in an attempt to secure some additional uh, funding or an additional program to, uh, to bring this unit back online. Can you tell me who uh, Du Bois uh, Gilliam is? Du Bois Gilliam? Yeah. Du Bois Gilliam, uh, at the time I was serving as assistant secretary, was uh, a deputy assistant secretary in the Office of Community Planning and Development. Uh, in, in, Hart, in HUD, Washington. HUD, Washington. Yeah. Was he still in, uh, an employee of HUD after you left? Yes, he was. Yeah. Did you um, ever or did any of your firm ever make a payment to Mr. Gilliam while he was a HUD employee? A payment to Mr. Yeah, Gilliam? $2,000. Any, any payments of any kind? No, not a payment. Now, now, there was a situation in which Mr. Gilliam, who at that time was a friend of mine, called me and said that he was uh, in a very bad financial condition. I think he said that his wife had left him, this was one weekend, and uh, his, his, children, his children literally did not have food. And he asked me to borrow $2,000. And I yeah. thought about it, and I loaned him $2,000. So you loaned um, uh, Du Bois Gilliam uh, $2,000? Yes, I did. Yes. Was he an employee of HUD at the time? Yes, he was. And you're saying an employee of HUD did not have enough money to, could you explain that conversation? Okay. Apparently he was having family problems. He called me one uh -huh. weekend and indicated to me that he, was, uh, in very, that he was in very bad shape. He had two children yeah. and that he needed uh, money to pay his rent, to buy food and uh, other things. Uh, and he needed it by Monday of the, of, of the following week. I thought about it all weekend. He called me back again. And uh, on Monday, I uh, sent him $2,000. I loaned him $2,000. Did you send a letter saying this is a loan? Yes, I had a note from Mr. Gilliam indicating that it's a loan. Um, I, I required that he give me a note for, for uh, it. Would you please um, make sure the committee gets I, a, I certainly and will. And I, I think an explanation of this. Um, did you have any dealings with this individual? Uh, professional dealings with him? Uh, it, was he not a player in, in some of the work that you were involved in? With respect to the, uh, the uh, community planning and development aspect of the Drake, I think I had met with Mr. Gilliam prior to uh, the call. Yes. So he was involved uh, with the Drake project? Well, he was, re he was involved as, as being the deputy assistant secretary on one of the program areas that was involved with some of the matters that we discussed with the Drake, yes. Now, explain to me, just go back, why wouldn't this have been a project you would have remembered to tell me about, the Drake project? Well, I mean, I, we're talking about last year, we're talking about uh, uh, a project that you say you, you do not have any financial interest on in it whatsoever in this Drake project? No, sir, I do not. Okay. Uh, you, you're not, you do now not. Now, the question is, do I have an equity in, in, interest in the Drake Hotel? Yeah. No, I do not. Well, what, maybe I should ask the question differently. Do you have any any financial interest, any equity interest in anything to do with this project? No, sir, I do not. Okay. Uh, how much money have you received in your work for this project? For that, I was an employee. I, I received a salary. I received a salary from the company. Now, so you were... You so were, it wasn't based on a project basis. Okay, so you were... Uh, is, was this... Were you doing consulting work besides being an employee of this company? Yes, I would do independent consulting work and, and, and the also work. And the name of the company again is what? The letter J and B, as in, in Boyd, James and Boyd. What's, H, what's HMB Development Corporation, Fort Worth, Texas? HMB Development Corporation is a company that I have personally owned since 1975 in Fort Worth that does development management and consulting work. HMB stands for Hamilton Morneys Bryan, which happened to be the first uh, letters of my three children's name. 
Do you which have, I wholly uh, own myself. Do you, do you have any equity interest in a business that has any equity in the Drake project? No, I do not. Okay. Um, this $2,000, can you, uh, uh, strikes me as a very unusual thing for someone to give an employee of HUD $2,000 or even loan him $2,000. Uh, with hindsight, do you, do you question the propriety of doing such, something like this? On hindsight, yes, I do. At the time, I knew Mr. Gilliam. I knew that he was having problems with his family. And uh, he had indicated to me that, uh, that he certainly needed this Monday, uh, money by Monday of the following week. He called me on a Saturday. I remember it very well. And uh, I thought about it before, before I wire transferred him the money. Okay, now, now this, I'm assuming he's a very, very close personal friend? Well, he's, he, he was a, 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 a close personal friend, yes. Pardon me? Yes, a close personal friend. That's why who, I was willing to listen to him. Who, who, would, who would you define as some of your other close personal friends at HUD besides Mr. Gilliam? Well, Mr. Gilliam was a friend. I mean, someone that you would be willing to lend $2,000 to on a phone conversation that said uh, that, you know, I'm in deep trouble, please send me $2,000. Uh, who else? Well, I think it would depend on, on the circumstances of Mr. Shays. Mr. Gilliam is a person that called me and asked me, and I agonized over that over the weekend and uh, was willing to do it. On hindsight, uh, perhaps it was not the best thing to do. However, I did. Is Mr. Uh, Gilliam under indictment uh, right now? Is it's my understanding yeah, that he is. What is his indictment? I'm right. not familiar with his indictment. Um, I did want to answer to, to another question, and that was the question asking um, what other people y you knew well enough at HUD that you would have been willing to lend them $2,000? Well, I, I, I can't say that, uh, Mr. Shays. Uh, it, that was an unusual situation. I knew Mr. Gilliam. He called, and after thinking about it over the weekend, I was willing to let him do that because, primarily because of his children and the fact that I knew that he had been having some personal problems with his family situation. When and I can't, I can't say to you that I had other persons at HUD that I would be willing to, to loan $2,000. Let me ask you this question. Have you loaned anyone else at HUD, anyone at HUD, any money whatsoever? No, sir. Have you given anyone at HUD any payments of money, whether it was loan or not? No, sir. Okay. Um, has this loan been paid back? Uh, he's paid me back, I think, $1,500 of the $2,000. The, um, there's an individual named James Ba who I happen to know and respect very much. I will say that to you. But I am very perplexed uh, why you would be associated with an effort to uh, uh, a, a Jim Ba Legal Defense Fund. He's been indicted. Yes. Uh, your name is the first of co-chairs along with Lance Wilson who uh, has been a very, very reluctant witness before this committee. Uh, in which we have tremendous concerns about his ethical conduct. Uh, you are associated with that, and you sent a letter to the housing authorities uh, throughout the country. Isn't that correct? Uh, let, me, let me say this. I know Mr. Ball. I am not familiar with all the circumstances uh, with his problems. A group of us who were discussing ways, uh, since he had lost his job, uh, that we could possibly be helpful to him in this, in this crisis. And uh, I was willing to be one of the persons that would uh, uh, lend my support to Mr. Ball at, at this time. And uh, letters were sent to individuals. Uh, isn't, it, isn't it a fact that they were basically sent to housing authority officials, directors of various housing authorities, that, was, Jim, ba, that Jim Ba had taken a deep interest in while he was, was head of uh, Indian and, and public housing? In the affairs of public housing. Uh, I did not see the letters before they were remitted. Well, number one, I mean, Mr. Chase. However, I was told that some of the letters did go to individuals that worked for uh, housing authorities that were interested, had indicated in, or expressed an interest in being helpful to him if they could. The gist of the letter is, I'll just read you one paragraph. It says, despite, this is a letter sent July 5th, despite the impressive strides he made on behalf of public housing, Dr. Ba was recently indicted by Washington, D.C. grand jury for actions they claim he made in his official duty. Again, Dr. Ba is being victimized by the same machinery that has targeted other leaders nationwide. What do you, what's meant by that? 
Mr. Mr. Excuse me. Could I, could I possibly see the letter, Mr. Shea? Sure. Let me just, I, I've circled the other part. The other part says in the last paragraph, those of us who know Dr. Barr are outraged at the charges. I happen to know him. I happen to respect him a lot. Uh, let me just tell you the, the paragraphs I was looking at. The fourth paragraph, it starts as despite. Why don't you read the whole letter? Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you for yeah, me, no, allowing no, me to read the letter, Mr. Shane. <laughs> Uh, I did not write the letter. I did lend my support to the effort to be helpful to Mr. Ball. As a matter of fact, this is the first time that I've seen the letter, but I did lend my support to this letter, and I do have the utmost respect for Mr. Ball. Well, I have the utmost respect for him as well, uh, but I'd, I'd love to know what it means that he's been victimized by the same machinery that has targeted other leaders nationwide. This, this is the first time that I've, that I've seen the letter. Are you outraged? Are you outraged that he would be charged? In other words, there was, there was uh, it appears, um, uh, ample proof that he at least should be charged. Uh, are you outraged that he would be charged? Well, I'm, I'm very concerned, and I'm certainly hoping you, that, uh, that some mistake has been made. Well, that's a little different. I mean, do you have any facts that would tell us that he shouldn't have been charged? No, I'm not even really familiar with the, uh, with the facts of the case. Do you think it's appropriate for an individual like yourself, who's now outside of HUD, to be writing letters to individuals who have benefited from Mr. Ba's work? I mean, uh, it just seems to be highly appropriate to send a letter to the executive director of the various housing authorities throughout the country. Well, Mr. Shays, I think uh, in the process of uh, deciding who these letters would go to. Some individuals from housing authorities had contacted some of the people that were involved, indicating an interest in trying to be supportive to Mr. Ball if they could. Mm -hmm. And of course, this was a, a letter indicating that it would be helpful if you can. And uh, I don't even know what the response has been so far uh, to the letter. Let me just ask you this, and I'll, I'll close up uh, my questions. Uh, um, I know Mr. Wise was actually ahead of me. All right. Um, but um, I'd like you to run down and tell me the various players that we see on the letterhead that you have before you. Marie Sparksdale, that's you. Lance Wilson? Lance Wilson, of course, was the executive assistant to uh, Secretary Pierce. Thomas Lewis? Thomas Lewis, uh, I think, is the present uh, executive director of the uh, Detroit Housing Authority. Mm -hmm. uh, George James? I don't know Mr. James. Uh, Zerl Smith? Uh, I, uh, I don't know Mr. Smith. Okay, and Alan Moran? Al Moran. Moran. Al Moran, it's I'm sorry. Al Moran. Al Moran at one time was the uh, Assistant Secretary for Community Planning and Development at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I've finished my questions right now, but I just want to say to you, Mr. Barksdale, I, I, um, I've been looking for HUD heroes, and um, there was, I had this feeling like you know, it, I felt good that you said no to a number of projects while you were there. I just am very uncomfortable uh, since you've left HUD that, that uh, one, you wouldn't be able to rattle off those projects to me that you've been involved in when you've made $300,000. That, that leaves me a little uncomfortable. It leaves me uncomfortable that you would uh, uh, have been involved in the Drake project and not be able to recall it to us very quickly. Uh, I'm uncomfortable that you would have lent a, a HUD employee who you had a reason to want a favorable decision from or recommendations 
two thousand dollars, and I'm uh, I'm I'm very concerned with the tone of this letter. Uh, I think I respect Jim Ba as much as you do, but the tone of this letter is pretty outrageous, and I'm very concerned with the fact that it was sent to people who were in essence uh, beneficiaries of Mr. Ba's work, not personally, but beneficiaries of what he had to do in his work at HUD. And I just, uh, it just raises a number of questions that I, I hope we'll have some answers to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman Wise. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Barksdale. You mentioned in the Colonial House uh, project that you had expressed your concerns about it. Were those concerns expressed in writing? My concerns uh, were not expressed in writing. It was a fast-moving situation, Mr. Wise, when I was literally called approximately two days or maybe three days, to best of my recollection, before the, uh, the uh, project was scheduled for closing. So my actions were, sure. So my actions were uh, directed uh, towards my staff uh, on an immediate basis. And uh, other than expressing my uh, dissatisfaction to my staff and asking them to uh, immediately brief me on the circumstances, uh, involved with the closing. I don't think I wrote a, a memo or, or a letter or, or to anybody that I can remember with respect to the D, uh, Colonial House closing. Were there other major projects like that that uh, proceeded uh, even though you had raised concerns or objections to them? Not that I can recollect, Mr. Wise. This was just such an unusual situation because of the <laughs> Houston housing market and the amount of units that were involved. 1,818. That, that was something that uh, just didn't happen every day, and to the best of my recollection, it didn't happen again before I left. And do you recall, uh, because that, obviously that did run counter to your best judgment, and I think time has borne you out in that, do you recall whether or not you might have even uh, dictated a file memo or some other statement for the record of how you felt about this uh, in case it did blow up in somebody's face later? No, I don't think I uh, dictated a memo to the file. Okay. I do not remember dictating a memo to the file. I'm just curious, the Drake Hotel project, is that an SRO project? Is that a single room occupancy uh, project? Yes, I think it's, it's the conversion of an, of an old hotel into housing. Into housing or into single room occupancy? A single room occupancy. Yeah. And how many I units would that be? I uh, don't recall at this time. It's, it's would been, it be more than uh, uh, 120? It could be, Mr. Wise, but truthfully, I don't recall at this time. I would appreciate uh, if you would supply that information well, to I'll the I'll be happy to. I'd indicate it to the chairman and to uh, Mr. Shays that I would give a detailed uh, listing, and I will, I will do that. Because as I'm sure you, you recall, single room occupancy is uh, rare as hen's teeth right now. And in fact, last year, because we were trying to get single room occupancy in my area also, um, and as you recall, there I believe there were the most 1,200 units allocated nationwide or available nationwide. So I'm. Well, so well I can't recall if it was uh, SRO, but I certainly will review the yeah. file and I certainly will provide the information. Mm -hmm. Now, you testified that you're a hands on manager. I believe. Is that correct? I like to be involved, yes. And I may have missed, and if I am, please correct me. I thought I heard you say, and I was involved in, unfortunately, another conversation, oh. that Secretary Pierce was not exactly a hands-on manager. Is in that my, correct? In my opinion, uh, he was not the kind of hands-on manager that I am that, mm -hmm. that gets involved on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, or how about a week-to-week -week or month-to-month -month basis? <laughs> well, he I'll, just I'll just let that slip. Um, but, as, but you worked with Secretary Pierce for uh, four years of his, of his term, isn't that no, correct? No, I worked from October of 1982 until January of 1985. However, for the first uh, possibly 15 months of that period, I was a Deputy Assistant Secretary, and in that capacity, I did not have that much, uh, if any, direct contact with Mr. Pierce, the Secretary. When I moved up to the Assistant Secretary level, of course, I did have uh, more contact with him. But for, I think, at least a year then, you were assistant secretary. That, that so is correct, a little and, over a year. And 
in the HUD hierarchy, were you not then directly under Secretary Pierce on that, the chart? That is correct. I'm so you had some time to observe Secretary Pierce's operation. Yes. And let's be candid. If you needed something done in that year, did you go to Secretary Pierce or did you go to somebody else in the office? It would depend on the kind of question I needed answered, but in most instances I would call his office and, and speak with his executive assistant who would pass it on to the secretary. And that person was? Uh, at the time I was there, Lance Wilson was executive uh, assistant for a while and then Deborah Dean, I can't remember when, succeeded Lance Wilson, I think in the, in the spring or summer of 1984. And when the response came back from Secretary Pierce's office, did Secretary Pierce communicate it to you or did usually the executive assistant? Generally, it would be through the executive assistant unless it was something that he had uh, specifically asked me to give him a status report on. And then maybe I would call him and give him a, a report. And the reports generally would be compiled by my staff in a memoranda and it would be sent back up to the Secretary's office. Now, uh, Consultants call uh, with distinguished names, and you've mentioned already that former Interior Secretary James Watt had telephoned you. Uh, did you make a report of that to uh, the executive assistant or to Secretary Pierce? I don't recall uh, making a report to Secretary Pierce or the, uh, or the uh, executive assistant on that call. I think I indicated to the chairman that I suggested that he, that, that he might want to call and, and talk to the secretary but I don't recall uh, uh, notifying uh, his office. Who succeeded you in your position when you left to become, uh, uh, when you left HUD? I left in January of 1985, and I think in the fall of 1986, Thomas Demery was uh, nominated for the position. Okay. And uh, who, the person that succeeded me, though, when I left was an acting person, Shirley Wiseman, who was my, who was my general deputy assistant secretary. Had you worked with Mr. Demery before uh, uh, he came to that position as Assistant Secretary? As Deputy Assistant Secretary and uh, Assistant Secretary for Housing, Mr. Demery was one of our field consultants in multifamily who uh, had the responsibility of moving around the country and trying to work out our problem projects, projects that either had been assigned or were in the, in the process of being assigned to the, to the department. So I knew him in that capacity. Okay. Now, Mr. Barksdale, uh, it's January of 1985. The administration has just won an overwhelming victory, uh, presumably a mandate to carry on the policies. Um, why did you choose to leave at that time? At that time, I had two serious uh, situations in my family. Uh, as I indicated to the chairman in my opening remarks, my family in Fort Worth had been involved in the real estate business for many years. My mother had terminal diabetes, and my uncle, who was really the titular head of the family at that time, had terminal cancer. And over the Christmas holidays, we had discussed uh, the fact that I needed to return home as soon as possible. And uh, I submitted my resignation and moved back to Fort Worth, among other reasons, to, to be. My, and, and by the way, both of them have passed away since my return to Texas. My mother died, and my uncle passed away. I understand in, in I'm sympathetic to the personal concerns, but was there, was there anything else involved? For instance, uh, uh, were you concerned about s some of what was going on at HUD at the time uh, with your ability to interact uh, with the Secretary's office? Uh, did you uh, sense that it might be a good time to leave uh, because of, of uh, developments occurring in HUD? No, I didn't have those concerns. I left because of the reasons I indicated. It was personal reason. That's why I left. And you had mentioned that uh, you owned since 1975, a, I believe you said HMB. Development Corporation. Okay. Uh, what was your relationship with that company while you were involved with HUD? Prior to me reporting on board, I had to, of course, fully disclose uh, to the department those areas that I was involved in, HMB being one. And it was dormant for the period that I was with the department. When I left the department, I, of course, went back and reopened my company. But during the period that I was with the department, it was uh, dormant. Now, it's kind of inter well. Let me follow up. If, um, if someone were came to you and said, "How do I get mod rehab units in an area that needs them?" I presume the po and 
please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. I presume what you would have told them is to, you start at the, at the beginning, uh, you work with your regional office, uh, they, make it, they make recommendations, but you work from the, the grassroots up uh, as opposed to coming in at the top and going down. Is that correct? That would be correct. And was that the process that you followed as Assistant Secretary? To the best of my recollection, that is the process that was followed. The housing authorities, the PHAs, would write letters either to the regional office or the area offices, and, and this correspondence would pass up uh, to the uh, central office in Washington. But so the chain then, while you were administrator of that program, was to start at the bottom and work your way up until the final review process. But while you were the assistant secretary, did you at any time get involved in sending word back down uh, to the PHA to apply for a certain project that we, we've already given approval for? We've got consultants in here or developers, and, and uh, the word is out that you're to get this, so go ahead and apply for it. To the best of my recollection, no, I, and I want to make sure I understand your, your question. Would you, would you rephrase the question? Because sure, I'm, I'm uh, not sure. I'm not I, I being coy. Make, I, I'm just I'm not following. To, I'm trying to determine where this, uh, <laughs> you, I don't, it, well, let me ask you, have you heard, heard or read the testimony that was given in the uh, case of the project in New Jersey, the uh, Seabrook, uh, the Seabrook, Seabrook project, 320 units, I believe, in which uh, neither the town uh, nor actually the uh, PHA, in that case the State Housing Authority, really knew anything about the, the units coming until they were told they were on their way. I think I read about that in the paper. Yes, I did. And I, I did not hear the testimony okay. that day. I, I didn't hear it, but I think I read about it in the paper. And the testimony that unfolded in front of this committee there, at least, was that you didn't have the regular process by which you work at the, at, the, at the local level and you put together an application and you work it all the way up through the field office or area office and then finally it gets to your desk. Instead, you had the word coming from Washington down, you're going to get these units because you've got it. And the implication is that you had a developer who had the, I'm sorry, you had a consultant, not a developer, who had the connections. They've already wired it up here. You just send the paperwork up. Mr. Wise, to the best of my recollection, uh, that that was not the procedure that was utilized when I was there, and I don't recall uh, doing anything differently than that. Okay. What I did specifically. Now, mm -hmm. okay. I want to make it clear that I that I was not involved with the Seabrook property yes, that sir. you were discussing. Yeah, I, I understand. I would have, okay. Yeah. Right. Now, though, you've left, and you're a consultant. And you know how you ran the operation before, but you're a consultant. Now, in your consultant capacity for the last four years, have you found it better to go to the top and work down as opposed from the grassroots up? Mr. Wise, I've been involved, uh, as I mentioned to the chairman, in the, in the housing business for the last 21 years of my life on a direct basis. And I've worked with HUD for many of those years before reporting on board. And uh, it has always been my experience that the best way to, uh, to try to get a problem worked out is to start with the career people. I have a lot of confidence in career people at HUD, and I believed in starting at the bottom and working my way up, up to the top. I think I indicated earlier that was the situation I tried to utilize in St. Louis, that I believe in talking to career people, and then uh, if I am not, if I feel like I'm still justified after being turned down. I, th I think I have an opportunity or right to, c to work myself up the ladder, but I started with career people. Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because I thought I heard in your testimony to Mr. Shays, you made reference to calling some of the, the uh, top people in HUD. Uh, you referred to Assistant Secretary Demery. Uh, you referred, I thought, to a couple of others that you had called in relation to the Drake Project and perhaps others. I think I said after I had started with Ken Lang in the St. Louis office. I think I prefaced my mm -hmm. comments by saying that I started with Mr. Lane, who's the area manager of the uh, St. Louis office, and his staff. Those calls were made subsequent to uh, us getting into a log jam in St. Louis. But I started in St. Louis. But uh, I have to ask you in candor, uh, uh, as one who's a consultant, 
and presumably one who has experience in HUD, um, <coughs> how effective did you think you would be staying at the local level? Did you not know from your HUD experience that you had to get to Washington as soon as possible? Well, Mr. Wise, with respect to the matter that Mr. Shays had asked me about on the, uh, on the letter that I wrote to the Secretary at this point, we're still in discussion. Uh, I contacted the Secretary. He did ask staff, or he did subsequently ask staff to get back with me and, and kind of to uh, review the situation. And as of this time, we're still working on that particular matter, and it's been about two and a half years at this point. Let me ask you, in relation to the Drake Project or any other HUD project that you've been involved with and consulting with, uh, have you ever found yourself in a situation where you're pursuing contacts as a consultant or pursuing a process, a procedure as a consultant that you would not have permitted others to do when you were the administrator for the program? When I was the administrator for the program, Mr. Wise, uh, people were consistently calling the department, uh, all kinds of people lobbying for their properties. And so that occurred when I was there, and certainly I didn't have any reason to believe that, that it stopped or would stop after I, after I left. The question, though, is at what stage of the process are they calling and lobbying? At all stages, Mr. Mr. Wise. People See, I, I found out I made my mistake because I worked it as you said it was supposed to be worked. Right. And Mr. Shays, I think, has related a similar uh, experience. Uh, uh, and we worked it from the grassroots up. I always assumed that uh, after it had gone through a review process, it probably it may not have qualified on the merits. I'm learning now that what I should have done is to hire, actually what my constituents should have done is to hire a consultant who had connections and let them plug in at the top. And we could have saved a lot of, we could have saved a lot of paperwork. You know, this subcommittee has jurisdiction of the Paperwork Reduction Act. We could have reduced a lot of paperwork. Just call, call the top. Get a good consultant and call the top. Um, and so that's my, that's my uh, uh, question to you, is whether you found over the last couple of years that you were uh, able to, or you, let me back up, that you utilized channels that you would not have permitted others to do while you were administering the program. I don't feel that I, that I have, I, as I was saying as, in response to Mr. Shea's question about the letter that I had on, on uh, the Laclede project, and I'm saying it again. After, after over two years, we're still in the process of trying to resolve that matter. It has not been resolved at this point. So I have been all the way up the ladder, mm -hmm. and I'm now back at the, uh, at the staff level again, working with staff, trying to, uh, to get that matter resolved. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Marks. Yes, sir, Mr. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I don't have a long list of questions. I guess mine is a general one to you, Mr. Barksdale. And, uh, that is, it seems while you were at HUD, you were a, uh, a very fine public servant. And the questioning by the chairman has brought that out, at least in the instances that we are aware of. And uh, probably if there were more people like you and Ms. Wiseman and others at HUD, we wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't have all of these uh, hearings. Well, thank you, Mr. Schumer. I tried to be. Well, wait. You shouldn't have interrupted me. <laughs> but um, the question is, after you left, even though you were a fine public servant and, and all of that, you really did seem to benefit uh, in, in a good number of ways uh, from your previous experience at HUD, benefit in a very remunerative and lucrative way. Um, learning what you have learned about what has happened through these scandals, not just today, do you think something's wrong with that? Mr. Schumer, I can only speak uh, about my personal situation. As I indicated earlier, this has been my life's work. I think I'm a qualified real estate professional. And uh, I was willing to join the department in 1982, hopefully to lend the department to some of the benefit of my expertise. And I can only ask, when I left the department, since this has been my life's work, I, I certainly didn't know anything else to do but to go back into the real estate business. I had been a consultant before I reported on board. And certainly, uh, after I left, I Act but as isn't a consultant it, again. I understand that. But what we're dealing with here is not your expertise, which no one questions. Right. Um, what we're dealing with is the fact, and it's only human nature, and I guess the committee is beginning after S Senator Proxmire and others, and I hear the chairman and other members' questions, to grapple with, well, what happens 
let's say all the people who did wrong are both exposed. Anyone who did criminal, criminal wrongdoing is, uh, is prosecuted successfully. But Senator Proxmire had a very uh, troubling end to his testimony, which was a year ago we were at the Defense Department and uh, all these scandals came out and now it seems to be business as usual. And the difficulty is when you've served your government well for three years, and as you say, this is your life's work, and you are an expert, and no one questions that, um, it still may well be that someone else who has developed their expertise in the private sector or in Seattle, Washington, just to pick a city, and not it at HUD, would not have the same ability to get things done at HUD that you might have, simply because you work there. It's human nature. You know, uh, two people apply and they know the name Smith and they don't know the name Jones and Smith gets some preference. And so you begin to say, well, maybe we should have a long-term prohibition, five years, ten years. That, of course, means that when Barksdale was asked to join HUD, and assuming that HUD wants to get people like Barksdale internally and the government wants people like Barksdale internally, you probably wouldn't have come. If you had known that three or four years of government service uh, would then preclude you from going back to your field of expertise, which, which, which would naturally involve applying to HUD for other kinds of grants and things, you probably would say, the heck with it. I mean, I'm, I love my country, but I can't starve uh, for that love. What do we do? What kind of, uh, I st you know, I am troubled by what happened after you left, although I'm not troubled, at least, you know, knowing this, the amount of what I know about you, about you or your integrity or your honorability overall as a human being. So what do we do? How do we solve this problem? Well, it appears, Mr. Schumer, that certain modifications <coughs> will have to be made. Certainly, uh, Senator Proxmire uh, indicated to us this morning many uh, concepts that could be utilized to, uh, to resolve some of, the, some of the matters. I think this committee will, uh, when, it, when it ends its report, uh, will probably come up with some additional ideas, but modifications will be made. And I think the Senator this morning uh, gave us many, uh, many ideas that, that could be utilized. I thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman Shays. Uh, just for the record, um, I asked uh, for eight projects. You named two. Uh, I just want to be very clear. You cannot think of the other six projects that you were involved in? Well, Mr. Uh, Shays, they weren't necessarily projects. In, in, in some situations, that's why I have to go back and I want to be absolutely, absolutely correct when I, when I get back with, with this committee. Because in some situations, instead of helping people on projects, they had technical matters that they needed expertise on. And, and, and that's why when you say, projects, I have to go back and check my files. Well, you know, the, the problem is that, uh, is the technical expertise uh, getting HUD to agree to fund a project? Is that, is that, that's the not euphemism that we've to, gotten from Mr. Watt and others. Not necessarily to fund a project. It could have been a situation where a person was uh, trying to find the appropriate way to, uh, to get a management contract approved to, to see if a waiver was approvable. Okay. technical kind of things, not okay. necessarily just trying to get project funding. Let me, let me just ask you this then, very, very specifically. Were you ever involved in any mod rehab projects? Have I been involved since I've left the department? Yes. Personally? Yes. To the best of my recollection, no, I, I don't. As I don't. an employee, have you ever been involved in any mod rehab projects? How do you mean employee now? That I want to make absolutely certain that I, that I understand. Well, I mean it in as general a sense as I can mean it, so you can explore with me what you think I might mean. Were you involved, were you involved as an employee in any mod rehab projects? I can't be more specific than that. Directly or indirectly with mod rehab? Doesn't seem like a difficult question. That's why it seems well, like. Mr. Shays, I'll, I'll, I'll have to look at my files because I, I do not recollect at this time being personally involved. Were in you involved as an employee for any of your em employers? How many employers have you had since you, you left <coughs> HUD? 
Well, I've had two. I'm, wor I'm working with uh, Housing America Mortgage Company, of course, yeah. as I told you. Yeah. And, and, and I think I mentioned that I, that I work with JMB Management Company. Right. Let's just take that management company. Do, did, were they involved in any mod rehab projects? Not that I know of, okay. Mr. Chase. Okay. And I, I, I would have to check with them to make absolutely certain. But I know that I haven't been involved with any mod rehab projects okay. with them, okay. where I personally. Any UDAG projects? Well, I think the, uh, the uh, Drake was a UDAG that was developed by a gentleman in uh, St. Louis that was purchased by my company to be syndicated. Who was the consultant on the Drake project? I really don't know who the consultant was mm -hmm. on the Drake project. The Drake, the Drake project had been, Mr. Shays, yes. the uh, Drake project at the time my company uh, became involved, I think, uh, had already been committed to Mr. Thomas and he was in the process of, of closing it out. And my company purchased the, con the, uh, the uh, property from Mr. Thomas. So I don't know, I don't know who represented Mr. Thomas. Who is uh, Bob Rowling? Bob Rowling? Rowling, R-O-W-H-L-I-N-G. Bob Rowing was one of the. I, I, I may not have spelled that correctly. That's I think it's R O H W I N G Rowing. Okay. Uh, Bob Rowing was one of the uh, persons that was utilized by the department as an independent contractor to do work uh, on workouts on problem projects for the department. So he was hired by HUD <coughs> to work with on a project. Is that your is your is that your statement to me? No, no, no. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Bob Rowing, during my tenure with the department, was like Mr. Demery. Was he he was one of our field consultants right. and worked on an independent basis, not as a direct employee with the department at the time, but on contract to uh, do work for the department. Now, is he, was he connected at all with the Drake Project? To the best of my knowledge, he was not connected with the Drake Project. However, on the, on the LeCleed Project, the project that you have my letter to the secretary, he was involved for a short period of time in working with my company on that project, but as far as I know, he was not involved in the, so in the he, Drake project. He was hired by your company. Yes. But he's also hired by HUD. No, no, he had. Okay. Mr. I'll, Shays. I'll get it. Okay. I'll be patient with me. All right. Yeah. He had left HUD okay. prior to being hired by my company to do some work on the uh, LeCleve project. Okay. Thank you. Can you, can, this is my, why I was getting confused. Okay. The, the McLee project and the Drake project, how are they different? Well, there, there, there are two different projects. McLee, they're very close to each other in St. Louis. Uh, one is right down the street from the other. The Drake project was a project that was developed by Mr. Bill Thomas, and uh, it, was, uh, it was a UDAG project. He received UDAG yeah. funding to assist him in closing the property. My company purchased that project from Mr. Thomas. Okay. The LeCleve project had been owned by the company that I'm working for, I think, since uh, the early 70s. And so there were two separate projects all together. And to the best of my knowledge, I, I, I don't know who handled the, uh, the uh, uh, consultant, if there was one, on the Drake. Yeah. And Thank there was no consultant on the, on the LeCleve project that I know of because they already own that property. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank okay. you, Mr. Bush. Mark, still, before I dismiss you, there is one rather ironic matter I want to bring to your attention. Uh, there is a discrepancy in your testimony which uh, does not reflect negatively on you at all. I want to specify that before I tell you about the discrepancy. But it's a, it's a very significant discrepancy. You uh, 